Wi, nak letak background kat belakang tu? Kat tanah pergi kat video. Pergi dekat video. Ha, sekarang cek tak ah ni, apa? Ada ada training lagi ke ni? <laughs> training. Tak, sini kat sini ada tak ah uh, gambar yang dalam JPEG punya? Hmm. Saya pakai background real je. Kenapa tu dengan saya macam saya ingat yang saya? Ha, kat mana dah ada? Tak ada pun. Tak apa lah. Nanti tertukar benda lain mati je. Uh, we have 12 uh, quiz questions. I, you know, uh, I asked three from every uh, each of us. So uh, combined, we have uh, about 12 questions. Um, multiple choice and also true or false. So um, you are gonna uh, uh, ask all uh, ten uh, all five questions? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I will share the quizzes and uh, the quizzes, yeah, quizzes, and then uh, I will ask the question. I will host that thing. Actually, no. I'm the host today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can share content now. I will show the uh, quiz. So we are using Quizzy. You can see? Yes. All right. So we have about 12 questions. I've combined all the questions. For each question, uh, they have uh, about 30 seconds to answer. For online uh, class or online uh, session, Actually, it's better to use Squeezy rather than uh, Kahoot. 
Oh, because if you if you use Kahoot, you have uh, the, the the you know the viewer or the uh, audience need to have two gadgets with them because the question is in the screen. Mm -hmm. They have to answer using their phone. Mm -hmm. They have uh, if you if they are using only phone, it's really difficult for them because mm -hmm. they have to need they need to have two windows to answer. I want to ask the host. You you will give us a cue right when uh, we are going to be live in Facebook. The host is not answering yet. <laughs> Hello there. The host is muted. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have about one minute. Yes, one minute. All right. Hi, oh, host. Mr. Nizam is there. Hi, Mr. Nizam. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Mr. Uh, Ronan Nizam, one of our, our IT staff at <laughs> State of Science UTM. Okay, sorry, uh, yeah. Doctor, not live with uh, Facebook. Ke? Uh, dan nak start sekarang ke? Kalau start saya terus live kan je. So kita pun dah pukul 10 kan? Okey. Okey. Boleh mulai dah. Dah boleh ke? Okey. Ah uh, ah uh, Finizam. Ya ya ya. nanti boleh tolong record a uh, share away back. Dah session dah record dah sekarang. Recording now. Recording now. Okey. Nanti bagi queue eh, kalau dah lah. Okay. Bagi countdown ke? 
Yang ini tak ada countdown tu kalau stream dia ada. Ah oh, stream net kan? Biasa kalau fakulti apa ni uh, alumni pakai stream net gitu. Ah ya yeah, pakai stream net. Okey. Saya tengok kat kat Facebook juga ni buka. Jelas. Ya. Ya eh. Still there. I think the browser had a problem. Yeah, take your time. Okay. <laughs> Doktor Asmat dah bagi student link semua? Ada. Okey, okey. Okay. Dah viralkan dekat department dah. Oh, viralkan. Okey. <laughs> Dr. Julie, how, how long have you been there at UBD? Ah, uh, 16 years. Wow. I'm sure that you have learned Malay, right? <laughs> Nada, zero. Kosong, kosong. Kosong. <laughs> kosong. Yeah. Because, uh, certain, we certain uh, words in Bahasa Melayu is similar with uh, in Tagalog, right? Yeah, that's quite a lot. Anak, like, like, anak. Okay. Going live now. All right. Three, two, one. Start. Now. Yes. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all the audience of the online global classroom. Um, today we're going to learn about voltammetry, a practical beginner guide. And um, this online global classroom is specially brought to you by Faculty of Science, University of Technology Malaysia, in collaboration with the Bru University of Brunei Darussalam and also University of Science Malaysia. All right, together with me, we have uh, our three dis distinguished uh, panelists. Okay, I would like to um, introduce the first one. Associate Professor Dr. Jose Hernandez Santos okay, from Faculty of Science to Brunei Darussalam and um, Dr. Nurasmat Mohamad Shukri, lecturer of School of Health Science, University of Science Malaysia, USM and also Dr. Tana Lachmi Paramalingam, a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Faculty of Science, University of Technology Malaysia and me, myself, Dr. Faizwan Abdullah, a senior lecturer at Department of Chemistry, uh, Faculty of Science, University of Technology Malaysia. All right, today okay, we have about uh, three hours for our class and then um, the attendance in the form of Google form we will, we will be given in the, the Facebook Live, in the comments in the Facebook Live during the session and after you fill in the Google form, directly you will, have, you will get your um, e-certificate for this program and don't forget at the end of this session, we're going to have a quiz, okay? For about 12 questions and the top three winners 
will be a, will be given a special prizes. All right. What is what are the special prizes? Oh, that is top secret. <laughs> All right. So um, we we have about three hours. Uh, I, I'm gonna be the first speaker. Gonna talk about the basic thing about voltammetry, and then I will pass the baton to Dr. Joy, okay. Dr. Jose <laughs> Santos, to discuss about what are the methods uh, involved in the uh, the techniques involved in the voltammetry. And then Dr. Narasman will discuss about the uh, applications of the voltammetry. And Dr. Tanalachmi Paramalingam will discuss about the sensors development uh, using voltammetry technique. All right, are you ready? Okay. And then um, for now, I will start the session for the voltammetry introduction. I will share my slide now. All right, again, I would like to um, welcome all the audience to the online global classroom for Voltammetry, a practical beginner guide. I'm Dr. Faizwan Abdullah, I'm a senior lecturer at Department of Science, Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, UNC Technology Malaysia. And my field of expertise are uh, analytical chemistry, environmental chemistry, spectroscopy, and as well as the electrochemistry, the topic that you are discussing right now. And I was born in Kuala Krai, Kelantan, one of the state in Malaysia at the east coast of Peninsula, Malaysia. All right, now, so we have heard about voltammetry so many times. So what is voltammetry actually? It is one of the methods in the electroanalytical methods, right? You can see that from the um, from the uh, chart, okay? We have uh, electroanalytical methods. We have interfacial methods and as well as bulk methods. And then under the interfacial methods, we have static methods and then dynamic methods. So under the static method, we have potentiometry and potentiometric titrations. And under the dynamic method, we have a control potential and a constant current. And under the constant current, we have a colometric and also electrogravimetry. And under control potential, we have constant electrode potential, colometry and also voltammetry we are here right so i'm going to use the pen okay we are here the voltammetry technique and then we also have uh, amperometric titrations and also electrogravimetry so voltammetry is one of the various types of electroanalytical methods okay so what is what is mean by voltammetry so voltammetry comes from several words. The first one is volt. We have heard that volt is about voltage, about the potential. Ampero, okay, is about ampere, it's about current, and metry is a measurement. All right. So voltage ram applied to electrode, and then the current will be measured in this technique. And this method is first described in 1922 by Herofsky one of the Nobel Prize winner. Okay, this is the history of polarography and voltammetry. It was first developed by uh, Ch a Czech Republic chemist, which is uh, Jaros uh, Jaroslav Herovsky in the year of 1922. He received the Nobel Prize in chemistry, right? For this work in 1959. And in the 1960s and 1970s, significant advances were made in all areas of voltammetry. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Jaroslav Herovsky is the one who discovered the voltammetry technique, okay, the theory, methodology, as well as the instrumentation. And this enhanced the sensitivity and expanded the application of analytical methods. And the introduction of low-cost operational amplifiers also facilitate the rapid commercial development of relatively inexpensive instrumentation. So we know that basically the voltammetry technique is a cheap technique, okay, a low cost technique to analyze um, uh, our analyze, any analyze uh, as well uh, metals, okay, and also organic analyze, all right? So the instrumentation of voltammetry, if you have your voltammetry in your lab, so this is how it looks like, okay? We have a cell here, okay? This is what we call cell, voltammetry cell, all right? And, um, we have electrode up here, 
I will explain after this what, what is the electrode types in voltammetry. Okay. So basically, this is in the instrumentation of a voltammetry. Okay. Um, in the voltammetry, we should have a voltage source or potential step, all right, to supply the voltage. And then we have the polarographic cell. Our voltammetry instrument, we have the electrodes and cell. This is the most two important uh, things in voltammetry. And we have our data logger or data viewer, which is our computer, right? And then the, this is the schematics of uh, a measurement setup, all right, with two electrodes, okay? We have uh, here our um, our uh, voltammetry cell, okay, and we have a potential stat, okay. We have uh, the working electrode, auxiliary electrode, and as well as the uh, counter electrode. I will explain then what is the electrodes involved in the voltammetry, and we have the voltage source here, all right, and then the galvanometer, okay, here, and the potentiometer here. So this is the uh, a schematic. Uh, of a measurement setup of a voltammetry instrument. All right. So what is voltammetry actually? Uh, and we have to uh, compare the comparison of voltammetry to other electrochemical methods. So for the voltammetry, the electrochemical method in which information about an analyte is obtained by measuring the current. This is the most important thing as a function of applied potential. So it's about current and potential in the voltammetry, all right? And only a small amount of sample analyte is used. That's why I thought, uh, I said that the voltammetry is a cheap uh, methods of analysis, low cost method of analysis, because we, we only uh, deal with a, a very small amount of the analyte, right? And the same simple setup of the instruments. For the instrumentation, three electrodes, remember, in voltammetry, we have three electrodes in solution containing analyte, right? So meaning that our analyte should be in the solution, right? So what are the three electrodes that I have, I have mentioned previously? So the first one is the working electrode, okay? The micro electrode whose potential is vary with time. And the reference electrode, potential remains constant, okay? Uh, the reference electrode is to remain the potential constantly, okay? And the counter electrode, uh, normally uh, mercury or platinum, uh, normally we have a platinum in our lab, that complete circuit conducts electron from signal source through solution to the working electrode. And of course, in the cell, okay, this is the cell that I have shown before this, we have the supporting electrolyte, okay? Okay? Uh, excess of a non-reactive electrolyte, the the main criteria of the electrolyte should be non-reactive to the uh, working electrode. Um, alkali metal to conduct current. All right. So what is the cell? Okay, this is the voltammetry cell. This is the voltammetry instrument. This one is metrum. Okay, we have uh, this one is the real one in our lab. The real photo of our uh, voltammetry instrument in our lab. So this is the cell. Okay, so this is a measuring cell. We have all the three electrodes. All right, the potential is applied. For example, um, lead ion reduced to lead, and the current is measured. This is the example of the uh, voltammetry cell. For example, in the voltammetry cell, we have lead ion. All right, and then. We supply, uh, we apply the potential to the electrodes and the lead ion will be reduced to lead at the electrode, All right? So what are the electrodes, okay? In the voltammetry, we have three electrodes. Remember that the first one is the reference electrode. Second one is a counter or auxiliary electrodes. And the main one is the working electrodes. And for the working electrode, we have multi-mode electrodes, okay, MMS, and rotating, rotating disc electrodes, RDE. Okay, this is the two uh, types of working electrodes in the voltammetry. So we will discuss further after this, what is the two types of the working electrodes, right? So where are the electrodes in the cell? This is the diagram, okay? The auxiliary electrodes is here, okay? And the working electrodes is at the middle one. This is the 
a multi-mode electrode, okay? And then the reference electrode normally uh, consists of uh, agentum, agentum chloride and uh, potassium chloride uh, solution, okay? Provides, the function is to provide stable reference potential, okay? And the auxiliary electrode is for the comparison of the current, okay? So the main one is the working electrode, okay? The, the, the electrode that we use to, to measure the current from the uh, specific uh, potential of our analyte. Okay, so that is uh, another example of voltammetric cell. We have reference electrode here, working electrode here, and a counter electrode here. Okay, all right. And um, normally in the voltammetric cell, we need to stir the, so, uh, the electrolyte and the analyte inside the cell. Okay. For this one, for this instrument, they have a magnetic stirrer, but we have another type of stirrer that I will show after this. Okay, normally in the voltammetry, we need to push the solution with nitrogen because normally in, in any solution, in our analyte or as well as in our electrolyte, we have a dissolved oxygen that, that we don't want it to be um, there inside our solution because the dissolved oxygen will disturb the measurement, okay? We oxide the working electrode. We uh, will oxidize the working electrode. So we need to push, before the measurement happen, we need to push the solution with the nitrogen first to remove all the dissolved oxygen inside the solution in the voltammetry cell, all right? So for a few minutes, we push with nitrogen and we can assure that all the dissolved oxygen have been removed. And then we start our measurement using the voltammetry. All right, so the reference electrodes, the requirement for the reference electrodes, actually it provides a reversible half reaction with a nurse equation. The potential must uh, uh, doesn't have change in the experiment, okay? And it's constant over time, and it is easy to assemble and maintain. This is requirement for the reference electrode. And the function is to provide stable reference potential and potential difference between the working electrodes and the reference electrode, okay? For example, we have a silver, silver chloride reference electrode. Um, the potential is determined by the reaction. And we have also saturated calomel electrode, SCE, and the potential determined by this reaction, okay? We have two chemical reaction here, all right? This is how the reference electrode works, all right? Okay, this is uh, the real uh, reference electrode that we use in the uh, voltammetry cell. Okay, this one is uh, magenta, magenta chloride, and uh, potassium chloride with three molar. Okay, where are the solution inside this? Inside the tube. Okay, right, and the double junction system with exchangeable electrolyte. Okay, we can remove. You can see this is a. a it's like a screw cap, right? So the solution is inside here. So we just put and then um, tighten the screw, the cap here, like a screw, right? Okay, the second one is the counter or auxiliary electrode. So what is it? It is an electrode used in an electrochemical cell for voltammetric analysis or other reactions in which an electrical current is expected to flow. And this thing from the, the reference electrode, which establish the electrical potential against which other potential may be measured. So re remember, the auxiliary electrode is, is used, all right, to maintain the current measurement, all right? And the potential is opposite in sign to the working electrode and its current and potential are not be measured, all right? So often has a surface area much larger than that of the working electrode to ensure that the reaction occurring on the working electrode are not surface area limited by the auxiliary electrode. And the function is to ensure that current does not run through the reference electrode, right? In the three electrode system, which would disturb the reference electrode potential current flow between working and auxiliary. So, um, the most important uh, electrode is the working electrode, but both auxiliary and the 
reference electrode is to stabilize the potential and the current so that the measurement uh, of the analytes can happen smoothly. So two types of um, auxiliary electrodes uh, available, the platinum and the glassy carbon. All right, this is how the auxiliary electrode looks like. Okay, this is a platinum, right? You can see it's shiny. And this one is the glassy carbon, right? It's made from carbon. This one is platinum. And this one is the glassy carbon. And it's depend on the application, right? So now um, we come to the most important electrode in the voltammetry, which is the working electrode. So what is it? So the electrode in an electrochemical system on which the reaction okay, interest, the reaction of interest is occurring. And the anodic sweep, when anodic sweep is act as a, an, an anode, in the cathodic sweep, it will act as the cathode. Okay. And the function is to study the reaction of the interest, our analyte, and is often used in conjunction with the auxiliary electrode and a ref reference electrode in three electrode system. The characteristic is to uh, is divided into two types uh, of electrode, which the first one is multi-mode electrode, and the second one is the rotating disc electrode. And various geometries and materials ranging from small mercury drops to flat platinum disc. Okay, a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of a lot type of uh, working electrode, right? But the main one, okay. Multi-mode electrode, the category, the two main category is the multi-mode electrodes and rotating, rotating this electrode. All right. The mercury is useful because it displays a wide negative potential range because it is difficult to reduce hydrogen ion or water at, uh, at the mercury surface. So that, that's why we are using mercury. Its surface is readily regenerated, okay? And we can regenerate the mercury because it is in the form of Mercury is the form of liquid, right? Okay, and regenerated by producing a new drop of film on uh, many metal ions can be reversibly, uh, reversibly reduced into it. And then other commonly used electrode material are gold, platinum, and as well as the glassy carbon, right? So this is how the uh, multi-mode electrode looks like, and this is how rotating this electrode looks like, right? So the multi-mode electrode, we have uh, three type of um, multi-mode electrode. We have SMDE, okay, static mercury um, drop electrode. We have DME, okay, drop mercury electrode, and we have S uh, HMDE, which is hanging mercury drop electrode. And for the rotating this electrode, we have glassy carbon, uh, gold, uh, um, silver, platinum, and so on. All right. So now we uh, discuss about how mercury works as the working electrode. Okay, it can be exist in many forms and composition in solid, thin film, this uh, DME, which is discussed as drop mercury electrode, a hanging mercury drop electrode, a carbon paste, and um, CME. Right. Although um, it is toxic, mercury is toxic. But it has a large potential difference between uh, 0 0.4 to negative 2.0. It's a very large window of potential. Okay, at uh, 0 0.4, mercury will be oxidized. More than that, more than 0 0.4. Okay, the mercury itself will be oxidized. So that's why uh, the limit of the potential window for mercury is up to 0 0.4 because uh, more than that, the mercury itself will be oxidized. All right, in anodic dissolution. Right, and then uh, if uh, lower than negative 2.0, the reduction producing hydrogen or cation of supporting electro electrolyte will be happen. In ac an acidic solution, hydrogen will be produced much early okay, at negative 2.0 and the range will decrease. So hydrogen has a high over voltage, right? negative 1.8 to 2.3 uh, uh, volt, depending on the whether the supporting electrolyte is acidic or alkaline, and always use new electrode surface and no contamination. That is why we use a mercury, because we have uh, we can have all, uh, we can always have the new electrode surface. We can change the drop, right? And no contamination. 
Many metal ions undergo reversible reduction at the surface and form amalgam with the mercury electrodes. Thus, facilitate the chemical reaction at the electrode. Okay. At the electrode surface, and and one uh, the one uh, main uh, disadvantage of the mercury electrode because we know that mercury is high toxicity. Okay. So what is the advantage? Okay. Of course more reproducible surface we can change the uh, mercury drop okay so many times because uh, it is form of uh, liquid and more negative potential can be obtained in aqueous system and uh, amalgamation with heavy metal so the metal will form amalgam with the mercury right that is advantage all right and this the disadvantage of course high toxicity this is uh, how the uh, multimode electrodes look like okay in the multi-mode electrode, we store the mercury inside here, okay? And then um, we have a needle here, capillary. We have a capillary and a needle to flow the mercury, right? And we have the drop here. So we can control the drop. We can change the drop, okay? So many times. And we have the taper. So the taper is used to change the mercury drop electrode. Right. So dropping the first um, multi-mode electrode type is dropping mercury electrode or DME. So what is it? It's a working electrode made of mercury and used in polarography. The experiments run with mercury electrodes are referred to as form as uh, of polarography, even the experiments are identical or, or very similar to the corresponding voltammetry. And we can, you know, um, a characteristic of the uh, DME is this electrode are uh, used in electrochemical studies using three electrode system, of course. And then um, what is the um, criteria of DME is the drop is uh, the mercury is keep dropping, right? Uh, we don't we, we do not control the size of the drop. It will keep, you know, uh, it will become slowly larger and will drop with a gravity, right? So the size is keep increasing and will drop after it's uh, at the maximum size. So uh, we don't control the size of the ME, right? So the needle valve open continuously for the mercury to flow. Okay, we do not control the the, the valve for the dropping uh, mercury electrodes. So it keep dropping every time. Okay. All right, um, so um, the structure is a flow of mercury pass through an insul insulating capillary here, the capillary, right, as I mentioned, uh, producing a droplet which grow from the from the end of the capillary in reproducible way. So it, it keep growing and we become larger, it will drop. And then the, the new drop will be, um, will be flow and when it become larger it drop again this is the um how the dme is being used in the uh, multi-mode electrode so each droplet grows until it reach a diameter of about a millimeter and be released the release droplet is no longer in contact with the working electrode when it drops it will have no longer contact with the capillary electrode and as the electrode is used mercury collects in the bottom of the cell right in some cell design, this mercury pool is connected to a lead and used as a cell auxiliary electrode in some design of the voltammetry. So each release drop is immediately followed by the formation of another drop. When the, you know, the, the last size of the drop, drop uh, will be uh, will drop to the uh, cell bottom and then the new drop will directly form. All right, drop are generally produced at a rate of 0 0.2 first, right? So the uh, second one is a static mercury drop electrode, SMDE. So the drop size is determined by the length of time for which the fast response capillary valve is open. And the drop is dislodged by a drop knocker. So, so now for a static mercury drop electrode, we control the size of the uh, drop. Okay, and then the, the drop, uh, the mercury will be uh, dropped to the bottom of the cell after uh, some period okay the dispense and uh, not 
knock timing is microprocessor control. We control using microprocessor, the drop, okay, so that the size is constant. And typically coordinated with the potential path or square wave form. So what is a, a potential path, a square wave, we will learn after this. This mode can also use to generate the hanging mercury drop electrode, HMDE, required for stripping experiment. So for the uh, static mercury drop lateral, the formation of small drop constant. Okay, this, uh, previously for DME, the drop mercury lateral, the size of constant, right? It's become larger and larger and at a certain time it will drop and the new drop will be um, will be there at the capillary. But for the uh, SMDE, the drop size is being controlled and the, the docker will be used to release the drop and change with a new drop. Right. So now we come to the last part of the um, multi-mode electrode, which is hanging mercury drop electrode. So what is it? The hanging mercury drop electrode, HMDE, also known as a static drop mercury electrode, SDME, is a working electrode variation on the dropping mercury electrode, DME. Right. So it's quite uh, similar with DME, but uh, the hanging mercury drop electrode, we can control the drop. Okay. For one drop, okay, for uh, one volt thermogram for uh, one drop is used for one voltammogram, okay? So that um, in hanging mercury drop electrode, we control the drop, uh, we can change it for another experiment and uh, another voltammogram and um, uh, it's quite difficult, uh, it's quite different with the uh, dropping mercury electrode and uh, uh, static uh, drop mercury electrode because in the drop mercury electrode, we don't control the drop. It's keep dropping when the size of the drop is larger. And for the static drop mercury electrode, it's also drop uh, with a certain time with a control size of the drop. And for mercury hanging mercury drop electrode, we completely control the mercury drop. We can change it uh, in um, in every experiment or every voltammogram that we want. So normally we use one drop for one voltammogram for hanging mercury drop electrode. All right. So so this is uh, the, the the difference. Okay, of the DME, dropping mercury drop electrode, SMDE, static mercury drop electrode, and HMDE. Okay, so the drop time for DME, the drop time synchronized with the potential step time. So the drop area grows uh, during a current uh, measurement. Okay, so we can see the voltammograms like this, right? Um, for SMDE, Drop the uh, drop time synchronized with the potential step time and drop area constant during the current measurement. And for the uh, HMDE, only one drop. Okay, and then we can change the drop for another voltammogram. So we can see if we change uh, uh, for for the DME, okay, the drop area is uh, you know um, is keep on increasing until the uh, the mercury is being a drop to the bottom of the cell and keep uh, increasing again and again, right? After the drop is changing. And for the static mercury drop electrode, the drop area, because we control the drop size, okay? So drop the area is constant at one, uh, at one um, size, okay? And then we change. It's not it's not similar with the DME because it's keep on increasing. Yeah? The size is keep, keep on increasing. And uh, for the new drop, okay, we increase again and we change, uh, uh, the, the drop is changing and the drop size is uh, increasing again. For the drop area uh, for SMDE, so we can see the constant size of the uh, drop area because we uh, we control the size of the mercury drop. It is, it is not uh, keep on dropping like DME, okay, because we control the size and the time to or for the uh, for the uh, mercury to drop, all right? And for HMDE, it's only one drop for one voltammogram, right? So um, the concentration of the analyte, okay, different for the, for every um, every single multi-mode electrode, okay? For the ME, okay, the range of the uh, analyte concentration is ppm part per million. Okay, for static mercury drop electrode. The range of the uh, analyte concentration is low ppm, low value of part per million. And for HMDE and rotating this electrode, okay, for hanging mercury drop electrode and rotating this electrode, 
All right. Um, we can measure the analyte up to part per billion and until part per trillion, right? A very small concentration. Okay. Now we, we, we can see how the uh, mercury uh, being dropped. Okay. Let's see the video. Okay. Uh, sorry. I can make it larger. Okay, the, the, this is how the mercury drop change. And the uh, in the cell, we can see how the, the solution in the cell is being stirred, okay? Oh, the video is upside down, upside down, sorry. Need to change. Uh, That's why we, we don't see the video because it's upside down. Let's play again. All right. All right. Okay, that is a mercury drop that road. You can see that? This is the mercury drop. Right. One more time, I play. Go to play. Right. This is the mercury drop letter. Okay. And it's how this is how the stirring process happened in the cell, right? So, all right, so what is voltammetry for the measurement? Okay, voltammetry is a collection of technique in which the relationship between current and voltage okay, is observed during the electrochemical process. And the most important electrode in voltammetry, as I told you, is the working electrode, which could be made from a variety of materials, including mercury, platinum, gold, silver, glassy carbon, nickel, and palladium. After this, we're going to learn um, on the... Uh, Electrodes type, okay, uh, with Dr. Tana on the, uh, the electrodes uh, and sensor development, okay. And what is polarography, all right? When voltammetry is conducted with uh, dropping mercury electrode, DME, it is polarography. The dispenser suspends one drop of mercury from the bottom of the capillary. After current and voltage are measured, the drop is mechanically removed, and the, then a fresh drop is suspended and the next measurement is made. So that is polarography, okay, one of the technique in the uh, voltammetry, all right? So we can see the diagram of the uh, voltammetry cell. This is the uh, electro electronically controlled uh, mercury drop dispenser, all right? All right, and then we have a uh, column reference electrode, the platinum auxiliary electrode, okay, and light solution, okay, dropping mercury uh, working electrode. Okay, this is for polarography setup. All right, and the mercury drop, and this is we can see at the bottom of the cell a pool of used mercury. All right, in the polarography experiment, okay, using DME, the voltage scan, the potential is varied with the time, and after each new drop of mercury is dispensed, the voltage is made more negative. Right, and the current during the lifetime 
of the drop is the uh, the current oscillates permanently between a minimum and a maximum valve. The, this behavior is caused by the non-constant lateral surface uh, area and the current rise at the drop surface will grow, right? And decrease as the drop falls, then rise again because we keep on changing the uh, mercury drop, okay? Until the drop is being, uh, you know, uh, until the mercury um, so, uh, mercury drop is being uh, released to the bottom of the cell. So the surface area of the mercury itself will keep on growing from small to become larger and, and be dropped. And the, the new mercury drop will be there at the capillary. So that the current measurement also will increase until, until the drop, until the new drop, uh, until the drop become larger and the new drop there at the capillary. Okay. So the current will be directly drop zero and then increase again. It's like the, so the current and the um, drop size is, the current and the drop size is, um, you know, uh, the relation is exponentially, right? So the current voltage relationship, okay, in polarography. So you can see there, uh, there will be a limiting current. So the limiting current, is uh, is uh, of course related with the lateral size, okay, the surface area of the lateral, right? We have the diffusion current and the half wave potential. This is a scanning of um, uh, voltage relationship between in the in the polarography. So we can see the current in the polarography, right? So the half wave potential is different. Uh, for the uh, for every type of the electrode, the maximum possible working range of the different electrode, we can see there for mercury, okay, from negative two up to uh, zero point two, and for the carbon, the okay, glassy carbon, alpha trace, and so on, we have negative, okay, about negative one one point four up to one point two. And for the gold, we have from uh, negative. Uh, 0 0.6 up to uh, 1.2 and different also with platinum for about uh, negative 0 0.4 up to 1.2. So the rate um, at which analyte diffuse from bulk solution to the surface of the electrode is proportional, all right? Sorry, the, 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 the relationship is proportional to the concentration difference between the two regions. So. Um, the current is also proportional to the rate of the diffusion and the bulk um, from uh, from the bulk, okay, and then the electrode surface. At sufficiently high potential, the rate of the reaction at the electrode surface is so fast that the analyte is reduced or oxidized as soon as they reach the electrode surface, right? So thus, the limiting current is equal to the diffusion current, right? The limiting current is called the diffusion current because it is uh, controlled only by the rate at which analyte can, can be diffused to the electrode, right? The dependence of the measured diffusion current on bulk concentration alone is the basis for the quantitative analysis, right? So in the cell also, rather than the electrode, we also have the supporting electrolyte, right? So what is the supporting electrolyte? This is an electrolyte containing the chemical species that are not electroactive. It is important to make sure that our electrolyte, okay, electrolyte is not electrochemically active with the, because we don't want our electrolyte react with our electrodes because uh, the current we need to measure is from the analyte, not from the electrolyte. So the supporting electrolyte has greater ionic strength and conductivity, of course, we need, uh, uh, the electrolyte that have, uh, you know, uh, conductivity, uh, great conductivity, because we need um, our electrolyte to be electrochemically active. All right, and usually the concentration of the supporting electrolyte will be uh, from fifty to hundred times greater than the analyte. All right, the supporting electrolyte responsible to mass matrix interference due to the different in background ions in the sample. And the supporting electrolyte is widely used in electrochemical measurement when control of potential is required. This is done to 
The first one is to increase the conductivity of the solution. And then to eliminate the transport of electroactive species by ion migration in the electrical field, and then to maintain the constant electronic strength, and as well as to maintain the constant pH of the solution. All right, so the role of the supporting data like this to provide the solution to be studied with some conductive properties, right? And then uh, the, the solution to be studied is mainly either non or poor conductive and make it practically impossible to pass electrical current between electrodes immersed in that solution, right? And to suppress the migration. The potential difference between electrodes immersed in solution and present of an electrical field, right? So, so the main thing of the supporting electrolyte is, is uh, we need it to support our analyte, right? Um, and not um, disturbing the reaction with uh, reacting with the working electrode. It's only to support. That's what, uh, what we call supporting electrolyte. It should be, uh, it should have a great electrochemically, um, you know, active and it should be uh, a conductivity. Um, it should have also a, a great conductivity properties, right? So the, uh, the, the, the migration of particle in the solution, uh, especially in the cell, in the voltammetry cell, it will be happen in three ways, okay? The first one is convection, the force con uh, convection of analyte towards the surface of mercury electrode by the action of the stirring magnetic uh, uh, stirring. I show you this, the stirring process before this in the cell. And also um, using a magnetic stirrer. And before experiment and during the experiment. It will be on before experiment. And the stirring process must be off during the experiment, right? And uh, it also can, uh, the migration of the particle in the solution also could be happen uh, using migration. The moving due to the attraction force of the electric field generated by the electrode towards every ion having opposite charge, right? That is um, the migration of particle uh, through migration. And the third one is uh, the migration of the particles in the solution through diffusion, okay? Where the spontaneous movement of, the do of those chemical compounds subjected to the concentration gradient, right? So um, there are also a lot of um, techniques involved in the voltammetry. So um, to learn more about the techniques in the voltammetry, so I pass the baton to Dr. Joy, or Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Jose Hernandez Santos to discuss about it. And uh, thank you um, for the first part, for li uh, listening to for the first part of the uh, online global classroom. Now we will have Dr. Joey. Are you ready? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So Dr. Joey, you can share your slide now. All right. Um, can you see my slide now? Not yet. Oops. All right. I'm sharing it already. Share screen two. All right, can you see my slide now? Hello, hello. Uh, yes, we can see your slide now. All right, okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the, the very enlightening first part, Dr. Faizuan. So first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Science, University of Technology Malaysia for inviting me to take part in this online global classroom as one of the speakers. And it is actually very encouraging and inspiring for my part to be able to interact online uh, with students and staff from uh, other countries, particularly Malaysia. And I think we have uh, students also from Brunei and the Philippines. All right, let me get my pointer. All right. <clears throat> Okay, let me begin from the very basic of voltammetry. I think you already know that in, vol in voltammetry, we change the potential, and as we do that, we measure the current, right? So this is the main idea in voltammetry. And there are actually many possible scanning modes. There's many, there are many ways by which we can change the potential. Right? And while we do that, we can actually monitor the current. And I'm going to discuss it later. 
Now, also, we ha you have learned that there are many types of electrodes. We have the most popular probably is the mercury electrodes, but we can also use platinum electrode and all other uh, inert metals like uh, silver, gold, palladium. And also the carbon-based electrodes are very popular, like glassy carbon electrode and the carbon paste, right? And also this voltammetry is used both in qualitative and quantitative analysis. And uh, we can actually use the voltammogram. Oh, by the way, the plot of potential versus current is called voltammogram. So the technique is called voltammetry and the plot is called uh, voltammogram. And the, voltam the voltammogram can be used for qualitative and quantitative analysis. So the limiting current, for example, is used for quantitative analysis. And the position of those current would be used for qu qualitative analysis. And you have also learned that it uses a three electrode arrangement. So I'm not going to expand more on that one. So in real life, this is how a voltammetric setup looks like. And as Dr. Faizwan mentioned, when you are using the dropping mercury electrode, there's a special term uh, for that voltammetric technique, and that is what we call polarography. So we only use polarography if the, if the electrode is the dropping mercury electrode. But all other voltammetric techniques use all other electrodes. So this is the voltammetric cell. And you, as you can see, these are the three uh, electrodes used in voltammetry. We have the one of these is the working electrode the reference electrode and the counter or auxiliary electrode. And you have learned also the purpose of using three electrode system in voltammetry. So I'm not going to discuss that any further. And this is your solution cell. And this is your cell containing the solution. And as you can see, there are many ports in this typical voltammetric cell. And this is uh, for introduction of the sample. For example, you want to spike standards into your sample so you can add uh, standards using these ports, and also you can actually use the port to bubble nitrogen or argon through so you can remove the oxygen. And I think Dr. Faizwan already mentioned the purpose of removing the oxygen. It's because it's in itself an oxidizing agent and it interferes with the voltammetric analysis. Uh, by the way, the uh, application of voltage as well as the measurement of current is controlled by the potentiostat. Right, and normally we have a computer system that uh, put everything in place. So all we need to do is put the sample there, and then hit the button, and cyclic voltammetry or whatever voltammetry we want to do is carried out uh, automatically. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are many types of voltammetry based on how the potential is applied. So so far we have learned that in voltammetry we change the potential, and as we do that, we measure the current. That but how do we change the potential? All right, the simplest way of doing that is through linear scan voltammetry. So in linear scan voltammetry, the potential is either increased or decreased uh, linearly. And as you do that, uh, the current is measured. Okay, so that is linear scan voltammetry. Uh, by the way, I'll be using in potential is either increasing or decreasing. Actually, both ways are possible. So if you are using the uh, anodic or sorry, oxidation uh, potential, then you should be increasing the potential. So if your target analyte is oxidizable, so you want to oxidize the analyte, and then you should be moving from uh, more negative to a more positive potential. So we are going to increase the potential if the target analyte is going to be oxidized. If the target analyte is going to be reduced, then the direction is from higher value to a lower potential value. So these two approaches are both possible in voltammetry. We can either oxidize or reduce, all right? So in linear scan voltammetry, we linearly increase or decrease the potential. Now, there's a variant in linear scan voltammetry, which we call cyclic voltammetry. So this is actually a combination of two linear scan, because what happens here is uh, the, from the initial potential, you go to a final potential, and upon reaching the final potential, you go back to the initial potential. So as you can see, there's one cycle here. So initial, final, and then go back to the initial again. And you can do that several times, depending on uh, how you want to study your analyte. So we call that cyclic voltammetry. So more than one cycle, we do we call that a multiple cyclic voltammetry. Now, another approach in applying the potential is through pulse uh, voltammetry. And we have differential pulse voltammetry or square wave voltammetry. 
And as you can see, there is actually, in general, the potential is increasing or, as they say, decreasing. But on top of that, there are pulses. So I'm going to explain later what are these pulses for. But uh, if you, uh, sooner or later, you will actually observe that the, the analyte will either be oxidized or reduced because you are increasing the potential. But there are actually significance how these pulses affect the result. All right, going back to cyclic voltammetry, this is the potential program in cyclic voltammetry. As I said earlier, there is a starting potential, and then we change the potential, and we call that the forward scan to the uh, final potential. And then upon reaching the final potential, we call that the switching potential. We go back to the final, to so the initial potential again. And the way the potential is changed is based on what we call scan rate. So one of the parameter in doing voltammetry is you actually uh, use some scan rate. The scan rate is how you, the rate of change of potential. So for example, your scan rate is 100 millivolt per second, right? So if you are scanning from zero to 1000 millivolt and then go back to zero, then if your scan rate is 100 or 100 millivolt per second, then after one second, your potential should have increased by 100 millivolt. And so if we are looking at 1000 millivolt at the switching potential, then it will take us 10 seconds to move from zero to 1000. So 10 seconds would be the forward scan and another 10 seconds would be to move from 1000 millivolt to zero millivolt. And that is what we call the reverse scan. So in total, we have 20 seconds to complete the cyclic voltammetry experiment. Now, at this point, I'd like to explain the potential window, which is partly actually explained by Dr. Fai Zuan already. Uh, this is very important when we are performing voltammetric experiment. This is uh, the electrochemical window, and this is the voltage range uh, wherein the supporting electrolyte or the electrode doesn't get oxidized nor reduced. It is very important that there is no interference in your analysis with the supporting electrolyte or with the electrode itself. And uh, this is an example of a electrochemical potential window. So as you can see, there's anodic limit and cathodic limit. So we normally perform this without the analyte. So it's kind of a blank. And so when you do the blank, that means just the supporting electrolyte and the electrode that you're going to use. And you see the anodic limit. That means beyond this point, either the electrode or something in solution, something in your supporting electrolyte is oxidized already. And on the other side, the cathodic limit, something in your solution or the electrode may be reduced. Okay, now typically the solution is reduced here, say water, and in anodic limit, the electrode is probably oxidized. All right, so uh, the area wherein we are free to explore our electroactive species is this flat area, right? So it is very important before we start any voltammetric experiment to establish the electrochemical potential window because. This part here is off limits, and this one is also off limits. We're only allowed to study within the flat area because there's no intervention uh, from the electrode or from the solution. So that is what we call the potential window. And to give you some picture, these are actual potential window from uh, different combinations of electrode and uh, electrolyte. So, for example, if you are using a platinum electrode and the supporting electrolyte is one molar sulfuric acid, the flat, the range wherein uh, the electrode is not involved in redox and this electrolyte as well is from here. It's probably around minus 0 0.5 or 0 0.4 to 1 point something, right? If you change the electrode, sorry, the electrolyte to NaOH, then you have this range. If you are using mercury electrode, and these are the uh, possible ref, uh, supporting electrolyte, these are the ranges. And as you can see, this part here is if you are using an aqueous uh, supporting electrolyte, and here we have carbon or like glassy carbon and perchloric acid supporting electrolyte, this is the range. Now you may be asking, what if I have a compound that is oxidizable uh, beyond this range? So how do I do that? Well, the answer is you can probably try non-aqueous voltammetry, and we can do that by using a solvent, non-aqueous solvent like DMF or acetonitrile. So, for example, this is the potential window for tetrabutyl ammonium perchlorate as the supporting electrolyte, and solvent is dimethylformamide. So it's actually very wide. So if you are 
expecting your analyte to be reduced at this potential or to be oxidized somewhere here, then this is very good to to be to consider. And uh, yeah, actually, a lot of application in voltammetry are in non aqueous voltammetry. So you can actually you are not limited to aqueous voltammetry. So again, this is very important that you know the range, the useful range of your electrolyte and electrode combination. Now, this is a typical cyclic voltammogram. So as I mentioned earlier, in cyclic voltammetry, you change the potential from the, the, the start and then to the final potential, and then you go back. So assuming we are trying to oxidize the analyte here or the target species, so we have the starting potential. Uh, typically, the starting potential is a um, potential wherein there is no oxidation or reduction happening in your uh, solution. Uh, because if that potential is already high or already very low to affect the oxidation or reduction, then actually the signal may be masked with something else. So it's not really good to start with something with high current already. So we normally start at, say, zero current. That means uh, nothing is happening with your analyte, so like zero volt or zero milli millivolt. And then we start imposing or changing the potential until it reaches a potential value wherein the species can be oxidized or reduced. And of course, during redox, electrons are transferred. And as you can see, current is a uh, flow of electron. So whenever electrons are flowing, that means redox is already happening. And that current is picked up here or is measured. So when we are doing an oxidation, we call that a nodic peak, all right? So uh, there are a lot of mechanism happening on the electrode surface, but as you can see from this response, from this voltammogram, we have a duct-shaped uh, cyclic voltammogram. So what happens here is the analyte is oxidized, and then it reaches a peak potential and peak current, and then it goes, when you go to the final potential, uh, you go back. And once the species is oxidized here, they are actually the same species that is oxidized is re-reduced. So the reduction happens here on the reverse uh, scan. Okay, so this is a typical cyclic voltammogram. And there is so many information that you can uh, derive from this one. So for example, if this is the oxidation uh, direction, and then we have the peak as the peak potential. So that peak potential is a characteristic of that peak. And also the height of the peak is what we call the peak current. And this is also a characteristic of this particular experiment. And when you go back, there is also a uh, corresponding uh, cathodic peak that is characterized by a peak potential and also peak current. Right. And uh, by the way, in IUPAC notation, anodic uh, current and well, anodic current is positive, and anodic potential is positive. And cathodic. So it's very easy to remember. So for oxidation, we are looking at positive potential and also positive current. And reduction is negative potential and negative current. So this is the summary of the data that we can extract from a cyclic voltammogram. And uh, of course, you have seen it already from here. This is if you have a CV, then you can actually analyze uh, the CV and extract this uh, information. So we have the cathodic peak potential, anodic peak potential. And then we have the formal potential, which is a midpoint between the cathodic and anodic peak potentials. And this is very uh, much related to the oxidation or reduction potential of the analyte. Then we also have cathodic peak current and anodic peak current. And when you uh, get the ratio, we have IP over IP is the peak current ratio. And these cyclic voltammogram data are actually governed by randall sefsi equation, particularly the peak current. Peak current is actually a function of the number of electrons, the surface area, the diffusion coefficient, the scan rate, and the concentration of the analyte. Right, and uh, normally, if we are doing a normal a formal course in voltammetry, you have to somehow memorize this and at least understand how the peak current is related to all this. And so, for a reversible electron transfer, or in voltammetry. Uh, reversible means when you are oxidizing and then the same uh, compound can be reduced back to its original form without any losses or without any uh, subsequent chemical reaction. So for a reversible electron transfer, uh, the formal potential is actually EPA plus EPC over 2. 
uh, the delta EP, which is the, the separation between the anodic and the cathodic peak potential, should be 59 over N. So if you have a reversible system and you want to find out how many electrons are involved in the redox process, then you just measure the peak separation and uh, 59 over N would actually give you uh, into the number of electrons. So if the peak separation is 59, that means there is one electron involved. If it's 30 or 29.5, then the number of electrons involved is two, right? So these are some of the information that you can uh, derive from analyzing the delta EP. And also for a reversible electron transfer, the peak height of the anodic peak and the cathodic peak should be equal. So the ratio should be close to one. And also based on Randall's subsequent equation, the uh, peak potential, sorry, peak current should be directly proportional to the square root of scan rate. And also the location of the potentials, the anodic peak and the cathodic peak potentials should be independent of scan rate. Now in this slide, this is actual voltammogram on ferrocyanide. So uh, in this experiment, we varied the concentration of ferrocyanide, one millimolar, two, three, four, five, six millimolar. And as you can see, the uh, peak potentials are clearly uh, illustrated here. So if you uh, evaluate the peak current in this uh, concentrate different concentrations of ferrocyanide according to Randall's subsequent equation it should be linear so this is the peak current in the corresponding um, millimolar concentration of ferrocyanide okay another experiment that I'll show you is the effect of scan rate on cyclic voltammetry so we have different scan rate uh, same concentration and according to Randall's subsequent equation the peak the peak current should be directly proportional to the square root of scan rate so when you plot the square root of scan rate it should be linearly relate, related to the peak current. So this is how you actually interpret uh, cyclic uh, voltammograms. Now I'd like to move on to uh, how to improve sensitivity and detection limit in voltammetry. Now in typical linear scan voltammetry, the current that we observe is normally composed of two parts. All right, so the first part is what we call the Faraday current and the other one is the capacitive current. So it's not always the Faraday current that we observe because the current that we measure, in this case, this is called the diffusion current, is actually a combination of Faraday current and the capacitive current. What is Faraday current? The Faraday current is actually the main current that we are interested, interested in. This is due to the reduction or oxidation of the analyte. All right, so this is our target current. We want to measure the current because that is related <clears throat> to the analyte. Excuse me. All right, the second current or the other part of the overall current is called the capacitive current. And this capacitive current, which we call sometimes called the background current, is caused by the charging and discharging of the electrochemical double layer on the surface of the working electrode. You see, when you are changing the potential of the electrode, so the electrode becomes negatively charged or positively charged, and because of that, uh, to compensate for the change in, in, in uh, charge, then the ions can actually move, need to move on the electrode surface to charge. And uh, due to this movement of charges, that is actually translated into current. So we call that capacitive current or background current. And that is part of the overall current that we measure. Now, how do we improve the sensitivity? We can actually improve the sensitivity by maximizing the Faraday current because we are only interested with the Faraday current. So to do that, we have to increase the ratio of Faraday to capacitive current. And of course, it's very simple, uh, simple relationship. To increase this, we have to increase this or decrease that. So we can do the improvement in sensitivity through increasing or enhancing the Faraday current and or decreasing the capacitive current. If we do that, we can definitely increase the sensitivity. Okay, so what are the two approaches that we can use to improve the sensitivity? The first one is by elimination of the capacitive current. So this one here, by lowering the capacitive current, we can actually increase the sensitivity. And the second one is by increasing the Faraday current and if, you, if we do that, we can increase the sensitivity. If we combine both, even better, because that would both lead to increased sensitivity. Now, to eliminate the capacitive current, 
the technique we used are called pulse methods, all right? And so far, the most popular pulse methods are the differential pulse voltammetry and square wave voltammetry. So in the next slide, I'm going to explain to you how this pulse method can actually increase the sensitivity by lowering the capacitive current. And after that, I'll be discussing the improvement of Faraday current through stripping voltammetry. And when we are improving the Faraday current, we are again increasing the sensitivity. And the stripping voltammetry that I'm going to discuss are the anodic stripping voltammetry, cathodic stripping voltammetry, adsorptive stripping voltammetry. So these are all belong to the same family called voltammetry, but these are more sophisticated because on top of just measuring the current as we change the potential, we are actually increasing the sensitivity because we normally apply this for analytical chemistry. So as much as possible, we want to make our technique sensitive and with lower detectivity as well. Okay, so in pulse voltammetry, this is actually what happens. Um, okay, this is the pulse, all right? So in pulse application, we actually have a dramatic increase or decrease in potential. Now, assuming that this increase in potential is sufficiently high to affect the oxidation of the analyte, right? So oxidation happens here when you apply this potential. Uh, and then, of course, that real, that uh, yields to Faraday current because oxidation happens on your analyte. All right. So just imagine you have oxidation happening here. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, you have a combination of Faraday, Faraday and capacitive current when that uh, redox reaction happens. So at the beginning of the pulse, both uh, current are actually present. And then as you move on, the IF, or the Faraday current, and the capacitive current actually decays. And during this pulse time, the decay of the Faraday current is, uh, with, is a function of square root of time, whereas the decrease in IC, or the capacitive current, is a function of e to the minus kt. And this is beautifully uh, illustrated here. So this is the decay of Faraday current, and this is the decay of capacitive current. So if you measure the current, here, then you actually suffer from a lot of interference from capacitive current because they're almost the same. But if you do the measurement towards the end of the pulse, then practically you have only the Faraday current, although it's a bit lower, but you have practically vanished the uh, capacitive current. So in normal pulse voltammetry or in all pulse voltammetry, we apply pulses and we measure the current towards the end of the pulse. Because at that point, there is practically no more uh, capacitive current. It has decayed already, but you still have some significant uh, value for the Faraday current. So this is, um, you know, the schematic of a pulse voltammetric technique. So you have typically increasing potential. See, as I said, overall, the potential should be increasing or decreasing, and then it is superimposed with pulses. So when you add this increasing potential in the pulses, you have a pattern like this. So these are the pulses and overall the potential is increasing. So if you're trying to oxidize the species sooner or later, you will oxidize it. But the question here is how do we measure the current? All right, so you can see the points here, these are where the currents are measured. So we measure the current before the pulse, before the application of the pulse and at the end of the pulse. And the current is actually the difference between the initial with number one and number two. And in normal, sorry, in pulse voltammetry, normally we get a peak type response, okay? which is actually very easy for us to evaluate because when we analyze just the peak height and that is related to the concentration of the analyte, we can easily prepare the calibration curve, right? So that is the main reason why pulse voltammetry improves the uh, sensitivity. Now let's move on to the stripping analysis. As I mentioned earlier, the purpose of stripping is to improve the Faraday current. And this is a very sensitive electrochemical technique for measuring trace metals. And that uh, effectivity in measuring trace metals is due to the pre-concentration step. So this is one of the keywords that is important in stripping voltammetry, pre-concentration. And uh, this uh, analyte are pre-concentrated on the electrode, they're a factor of 100 to 1,000. 
and detection limits are lowered by two to three orders of magnitude compared to solution phase voltmetric measurements. And another advantage is four to six metals can be measured simultaneously in various matrices at concentration levels down to 10 to the minus 10 molar utilizing relatively inexpensive instrumentation. So as far as stripping voltmetry are concerned, uh, we have at least three techniques. Of course, there are many other variations, but these are the main stripping voltmetric techniques. We have anodic stripping voltmetry, cathodic stripping voltmetry, and adsorptive stripping voltmetry. So one by one, I'll try to explain to you these techniques. And for all these voltmetric stripping methods, there are two major steps. Okay, just remember, we are trying to improve the Faraday current. So as much as possible, we want to increase the amount of material on the electrode surface. And we can do that through pre-concentration. So the first step in stripping method is pre-concentration. And it refers to the accumulation of a dissolved analyte onto or in the working electrode. So once it's pre-concentrated, and you can actually do it with time. So if you have very small amount of material in your solution, then you can do it longer. Uh, like we are looking at pre-concentration time of say from five minutes to up to like three hours. So just imagine if you have very small concentration and you can barely detect them by increasing the pre-concentration time, it's possible that they can accumulate on the electrode surface. So that is the first step in voltmetric stripping method, which is pre-concentration, probably the most important step. And then after that, once the analyte is pre-concentrated on the electrode surface, then stripping. So stripping refers to the subsequent removal of the accumulated substance through oxidation or reduction process. And of course, because oxidation or reduction happens, then the current due to this process is measured, and that is related to the concentration of the analyte. You see the picture? So in stripping, we try to pre-concentrate the, the material or the analyte on the electrode surface. And then in stripping, we remove them. And upon removal, it is accompanied by an increase or decrease in current, which we can measure and relate to the concentration of the analyte. So that is the uh, steps in voltmetry, uh, stripping voltmetry. Now, how do we pre-concentrate? You might be thinking, OK, uh, how do we pre-concentrate the analyte on the electrode surface. You see how we wish we can actually talk to the molecules. Because if we can talk to the molecules, we don't have to invent all these methods uh, anymore because all we need to do is talk to them. We can tell the analytes, hey, can you please gather on the electrode surface because we want to analyze you. Please gather because uh, our sensitivity is not enough for very few of us on the electrode surface. So of course, we cannot talk to the molecules, but uh, we can actually pre-concentrate pre them through chemical means, all right? So these are modes or ways of pre-concentrating the analyte on the electrode surface. Number one is reduction of metal ions on a mercury electrode and dissolution of metal atoms in mercury. So this is actually uh, what happens in anodic stripping voltmetry. Dr. Fai Zuan mentioned about the mercury electrode, right? And his example is on lead. And so what happens in this uh, approach when you are accumulating or you are pre-concentrating lead on the mercury electrode is <clears throat> you apply some potential which is enough to reduce so it should be sufficiently negative to reduce uh, lead two plus to lead zero and because lead metal is metal and it's soluble in mercury it actually they accumulate as they are reduced they accumulate on the electrode surface and if you do that continuously with time, and then there would be more lead metal accumulated on the mercury electrode. So that's one way of pre-concentrating. Another way is electrode deposition, very similar to number one, but this one is on inert solid electrode. So if you are using a glassy carbon, for example, you can also uh, deposit uh, after electrochemistry, those materials uh, that are insoluble in water. Uh, and once the redox happens on the electrode surface because they are insoluble in water, they will actually accumulate on the electrode surface because that is where the, the reaction happens. And also chemical reactions of compounds with electrode material producing insoluble products that accumulate on the electrode surface, right? So we don't really need redox prior to uh, stripping. We can actually have a chemical reaction happening uh, near the electrode surface. And then if this electrode 
uh, if the materials are actually accumulating on the electrode surface, then we can also do that as a means of pre-concentrating the analyte. All right. Uh, we have more adsorption of electroactive organic substances on the electrode surface. Of course, when the uh, organic molecule is adsorbed on the electrode surface, then with time they can also accumulate on the electrode surface. And adsorption of complexes on metal or of metal ions with organic ligands. Uh, surface complexation of metal ions, and there are many more ways of pre-concentrating the analyte on the electrode surface. We can also have ion exchange, electrophilic or nucleophilic interactions at the surface modified electrode. So this is actually very important. If your electrode is modified with like electrophilic or nucleophilic functional groups, and then the moment you immerse that electrode in a solution containing those substances that can be attracted by these electrophilic or nucleophilic uh, functionalities on your electrode, uh, before you know it, they will be accumulating on the electrode surface. So these are ways of pre-concentrating the analyte on the electrode surface. Now, uh, let's uh, discuss now the anodic stripping voltammetry using the mercury electrode, all right? This is probably the most used form of uh, most uh, popular electrode for stripping voltammetry or anodic stripping voltammetry, the mercury electrode. And it, this is because of the solubility of many metals in mercury. And the metals are pre-concentrated by electrode deposition, as I have mentioned earlier, on the mercury electrode. And how do we do that? Well, we deposit the metal cathodically. So this is an example. Uh, I mean, this is a mechanism by which the stripping voltammetry happens. So you have your metal. So just imagine this is a metal ion. It could be lead, zinc, cadmium, and so on. And if you are applying a potential which is more negative than the reduction potential, then naturally the metal will be reduced, okay? So if the reduction happens on the mercury surface, and then the reduced metal will actually accumulate as an amalgam. You see, the mercury with metal is called an amalgam. And the more you do that, the more time is spent uh, with that potential, more metal ion will be reduced to metallic form. And afterwards, you can actually change the potential uh, to more positive potential this time to oxidize back the metal into solution. So we call that anodic uh, um, stripping because we are trying to oxidize the metal that is reduced. All right, so that's the process. The metal in ionic form is reduced, so it's cathodic. And then once they accumulated as a metal on the mercury surface, they are oxidized back in solution. And the oxidation is accompanied by a current, and that is the one that we measure. So that is the main principle involved in anodic stripping voltammetry. So these are the steps. We have the accumulation time, and uh, during this time, the analyte is deposited as the at the working electrode uh, with a constant potential. And uh, the solution is actually stirred continuously. And then after that, we have the rest period, and this is actually to prepare for the subsequent stripping. So after the rest period for a few seconds, then stripping comes. So during stripping, the potential is scanned anodically. So we are now moving from initially negative potential to a more positive potential to oxidize the deposited metal, right? So at this uh, stage, during stripping stage, the metal is oxidized and depending on their oxidation potential, they will be the peaks will be appearing in different locations. So this is an example of an actual uh, ASV voltammogram uh, in determination of zinc, cadmium, lead, and copper. So if you interpret this, the deposition potential happens here around minus one point two probably. Okay, so if you hold the potential, so assuming you have a solution containing zinc ion, cadmium ion, lead ion, and copper ion, so not the metal, right? So zinc 2+, plus, cadmium 2+, plus, lead 2+, plus, and copper 2+. Plus. And when you apply a very negative potential like minus 1.2 or minus 1.3, these metals will be reduced on the electrode surface. And the moment you move the potential from the most negative to going to the more positive, and then because zinc is the one easily oxidizable there, and then zinc will be oxidized first, followed by cadmium, lead, and copper. 
And uh, you see, the way they are separated is actually very beautiful because you can analyze them individually. So these are some of the applications of mercury electrode in anodic stripping voltammetry. The elements that can be analyzed are zinc, cadmium, and so on. So I presented this table just to give you an idea that there are many metals that we can analyze using mercury electrode via anodic stripping voltammetry. So I'm not going to read them one by one because it's a bit uh, uh, boring, right? Anyway. This is the other application, but instead of using mercury electrode, you, by using graphite electrode, of course, we can use other electrodes, even if uh, we are doing a, anodic stripping voltammetry. It's the same principle. So we accumulate the metal and then we strip the accumulated metal. So these are the elements that can be analyzed uh, using graphite electrode via anodic stripping voltammetry. And these are the electrolyte, the accumulation potential and the peak potentials. Now, we can actually improve the signal in anodic stripping voltammetry. Actually, there is a broad range of research going on when we are optimizing the conditions in anodic stripping voltammetry. Just to give you an example, if your supporting electrolyte is just one molar hydrochloric acid and you are trying to analyze simultaneously lead, tin, and thallium, you can see that all the peaks are very close to each other, right? They are located near this uh, range. But the moment you change the electrolyte, uh, from one molar HCl to one molar HCl with two molar ethylene diamine, then you can see the peaks are somewhat separated. And if you try one molar NaOH and 0.2 molar EDTA, then you can see the separation as well. So by playing around with the supporting electrolyte and the ligand or whatever is interacting with your metal ions, you can actually improve the uh, separation of all this. And because if they are well separated, it's very easy to analyze them uh, individually simultaneously, right? So this is for one molar NaOH and 0.2 molar sodium potassium tartrate. So as you can see, they are widely separated now. Okay, so that's anodic stripping voltammetry. The second uh, voltammetric technique is uh, cathodic stripping voltammetry. Well, as the term implies, uh, the cathodic stripping voltammetry is very similar to anodic, except that the process is in reductive mode, right? So this is used for the determination of inorganic and organic ions. It, it differs from ASV in the accumulation process, okay? So this is what happens in cathodic stripping voltammetry. The analyte is deposited anodically as a sparingly soluble mercury salt represented as HG2A2. So, so this is what happens in the deposition. So the mercury is first reduced to mercury one, okay? And your analyte is typically an ion, forms an insoluble complex with the mercury one, and this uh, salt actually accumulates on the electrode surface. And in the determination, this is cathodically uh, stripped. So the mercury is reduced back to mercury. And as a result, the current is actually related to the amount of A that is combined with mercury one. So it's exactly the same principle as the anodic stripping voltammetry, except that the process is the other way around. Instead of anodic, we have cathodic process. And finally, we have the adsorptive stripping voltammetry. And this is very similar also to anodic and cathodic stripping voltammetry, but we are actually using adsorptive properties of the analyte in, uh, the analysis. Okay, so the word here is adsorption. And there are many ways by which the analyte can be adsorbed on the electrode surface. Okay, so here, uh, okay, maybe I'll just explain to you this. This is the metal that we are trying to analyze using adsorptive stripping voltammetry. Okay, so just imagine in the electrolyte solution, there is a ligand. So this ligand is in solution. And when you introduce the metal ion, they form a complex, all right? And once the complex is formed, this complex can be adsorbed on the electrode surface, right? So as they adsorb, they can actually accumulate on the electrode surface. So that is one way uh, to uh, accumulate the material on the electrode surface by introduction of the ligand that forms a complex with the metal and adsorbable on the electrode surface. Okay, the other one is you have a ligand that is dissolved, but before the introduction of metal, the ligand is first accumulated on the electrode surface. So it is adsorbed first. 
And once the ligand is absorbed, then the metal is introduced and the metal accumulates uh, on the electrode surface through formation of complex on the adsorbed ligand on the uh, electrode surface. So that's another way of um, accumulating the metal on the electrode surface. All right, in the third uh, approach, the metal is first changed to another oxidizing uh, state, oxidation state, and that one is either uh, um, adsorbed through the first or the second. I mean, uh, once the change, once the metal is changed into another oxidation state, it can either it can either undergo this, wherein it forms a complex first with the ligand and then adsorbed on the electrode surface, or it can be adsorbed later on after the ligand is adsorbed on the electrode surface. But in all of these cases, during uh, accumulation process, there is adsorption of the metal that is complexed with uh, the ligand. So here are examples of complexing agents used in adsorptive stripping voltammetry. And again, I'm not going to read them, but I think uh, just to give you an idea and get yourself familiar with uh, the vast uh, availability of ligands that are used uh, successfully in previous uh, adsorption uh, stripping studies. So I'm giving them here. And these are more uh, ligands that are used in adsorptive stripping voltammetry. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, which is actually chemically modified electrodes. I'm sure you will get a lot of chemically modified electrodes uh, with the presentation from Dr. Thana. And this is actually one way to somehow improve the sensitivity and selectivity of your electrode. So in chemically modified electrode, for example, you have a glassy carbon electrode, you modify the surface of the electrode by introducing like an electrophile, a nucleophile or enzyme or antibody antigen, etc. And all of these modifiers have a specific chemistry towards your analyte. So just for illustration purposes, assuming you have this modifier that only acts on the red circles. And then if that happens, then you get a voltammetric signal. So if you are analyzing, trying to analyze a square, which doesn't fit there, there is no signal. So if you have a mixture of this red and the green square together in a sample, then you can only analyze for this one. So this chemically modified electrode can actually be designed for a specific analyte for, for detection and for pre-concentration. Okay, so I think that's my final slide. And so thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Joy, for your very uh, you know informative and very interactive uh, presentation on the voltammetry technique all right uh without further ado next i would like to invite dr narasmat mamat shukri okay uh to you know to to share with us about the application of the voltammetry all right dr narasmat are you ready okay i'm here i'm all ready right. So let us hear from Dr. Rasmat. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning, everyone. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk about this application of voltammetry in the real experiment. But first of all, um, uh, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. Um, continuation from Dr. Faizwan. Um, me, I'm Rasmat from, uh, I'm born in Kuala Krai too, similar with uh, Dr. Faizwan. And then I also uh, gained my bachelor and PhD uh, from UTM. Basically, I'm a DNA of UTM, but now, uh, now I love USM, okay? So, without further ado, then we uh, proceed to my sharing for today. Okay. Why uh, scientists or chemists are choosing uh, instead of the uh, conventional method uh, such as chromatography and spectroscopy. As we all know in industrial application in 
uh, government agency, they plan to use uh, chromatography spectroscopy in uh, as their instrument for the uh, detection or analysis of analyte. Okay, so basically, uh, chromatography can only detect certain type of element, uh, which only um, restricted to maybe organic, uh, not uh, for inorganic analyte. But for spectroscopy, it can detect for inorganic analyte sample. But this one, uh, they only, uh, this um, instrument only can detect the total element that present in your sample. How about voltammetry? So for voltammetry, the speciality or uniqueness of this uh, voltammetry is it can simultaneously detect different type of oxidation for a species that present in your sample. Um, as been said by Dr. Joey, um, we can uh, using uh, using voltammetry, we can simultaneously detect uh, more than four uh, up to up to six species in a sample. Right. So for for example, you want to analyze the um, element of ion Fe, and then uh, as we all know, AAS um, only can detect total uh, ion Fe not rest, uh, it cannot differentiate between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus in your sample. That is the uniqueness of voltammetry that um, scientists choosing this method to analyze that kind of sample. And then um, for voltammetry, it can handle high salt concentration better than better than chromatography instrumentation. So for uh, this, um, if uh, we um, we have listened uh, the uh, sharing uh, from Dr. Faizwan and Dr. Joey that uh, this voltammetry is relating to the current, okay, current and voltage. To create current, you need to dissolve an ionic species, right? So for salt, if you dissolve it, it can uh, dissociate into ion that produce current. So this method also required lesser amount of the sample used. Besides, it's also capable to detect up to PPT level, which uh, can be considered one of the sensitive method due to this method uh, they include um, pre-concentration step during analysis and then uh, for this voltammetry we can apply this uh, to various of uh, field not resisted to chemistry so uh, we take a look at what kind of field or area that you that can be applied voltammetry so the first one must be chemistry right analytical chemistry physical chemistry in organic chemistry organic chemistry and then uh, food analysis also can use voltammetry as the uh, analytical method and then environmental forensic okay uh, since I am a forensic at lecturer at USM, so I apply this technique to uh, detect and investigate some uh, analyte um, that relate to forensic science field. And then pharmaceutical, agricultural, and also energy and fuel. So we move on. Okay, before we decide to apply uh, this voltammetry method, we need to have uh, and always remember this kind of principle, the core principle of uh, voltammetry. Uh, we need to um, we need to know what are the potential of the analyte that we are going to detect or analyze. If we don't have any idea, then we cannot proceed for voltammetry. So that's why we need to have the basic um, knowledge about the voltammetry. And then uh, as you can see here, this is uh, some of the analyte or the element that 
I am using in uh, my project uh, that collaborated with uh, UTM and other ag agency. And then this one is um, electro potential window. This this figure, these two figure already uh, already mentioned or already explained well by Dr. Faizwan and Dr. Joy. Uh, so I think uh, I don't have to explain again. But uh, in order for you to uh, detect or use this voltammetry, then you need to re you need to know about this uh, standard reduction potential and also electro potential window. Okay, for the Okay, for the application of voltammetry in the real experiment. Okay, for this uh, research project, uh, I conducted it during my um, earlier career as a lecturer because as a now we need to start with a simple one, right? Right. So for this one, uh, we conducted uh, a research and successfully evaluated the water quality, uh, including. Uh, analysis of heavy metal of cadmium, copper, lead, and zinc in river and tube well uh, in industrial and non-industrial area in Kelantan. So for this uh, research, we used um, Henny mercury dropping electrode. So I think you get, you have uh, watched the video that uh, Dr. Faizwan um, Okay, then um, for this kind of method, we use the technique of ASV, anodic strip voltammetry. And then um, after we successfully evaluated this um, kind of analysis, heavy metal analysis, we are going to um, develop the sensor for in situ analysis of river and tube water, tube well in Kelantan. This is uh, crucial for us. Uh, as we all know, we scientists, we need to remember that when we develop a method uh, in lab, we must transfer the technology and give it back to our community. And I believe that we all academic institutions share the common goal that everything we done in lab, we are going to transfer and we are going to share it with community. So, um, so next project. Okay, this kind of project, uh, I collaborated with Dr. Faizwan, and then um, which entitled of voltammetric technique for determination of arsenic and arsenic three three plus and arsenic five plus residue in calcium carbide ripened climatric fruit, uh, which is involved of um, local and imported fruit. Okay, for this kind of project, we use uh, or we detect the heavy metal um, as the uh, we detect arsenic three plus and arsenic five plus residue in both mango and banana from local and imported fruit. So um, unfortunately, we detect some contaminant of arsenic uh, in both of these fruits so um so for the precaution um you need to be careful uh, on what kind of food or fruit that you consume because this might affect your health okay for this uh, research also we, uh, for this kind of research we use another type of um electrode which was gold electrode for this kind of acne, we can uh, also detect using mercury, but we all know the drawback of mercury is uh, toxic, toxicity problem, right? But uh, another problem is you need to coat the mercury with another um, another substance to make it uh, uh, available to detect acne. So uh, to to make it simple for us. As a beginner, we just use another option, which is gold electrode. So for gold electrode, we 
also apply ASV anodic stripping water battery. And then, <clears throat> okay, for this current project, um, I'm focused on the water treatment. Uh, at the, uh, the first phase, uh, we have successfully treat the removal of heavy metal in polluted water sample. But unfortunately, we don't know the uh, source of contaminant uh, as uh, before this, we only using uh, AAS to detect the total arsenic in, um, in this uh, in the polluted water sample. Actually, this, um, this project is about this detection and removal of arsenic in uh, Sungai Rui uh, Perak that uh, contaminated with um, arsenic. So, uh, we uh, have developed, we have successfully developed a method to treat, but we currently working on the development of um, validated mercury method, uh, uh, water metry method for this uh, kind of project to propose to government agency and also industrial agency that uh, using water metry, we can identify the source of problem that uh, contribute to higher level of arsenic in uh, any type of polluted water sample. So uh, for this uh, research, we are using gold as electrode. As we all know, if uh, we want to commercialize this method, if you want to people know about water metry, the first one you need to um, introduce some simple method. And then uh, for industrial uh, application, they want uh, the one that commercially available. But after that, after we introduce the simple one, then we can uh, introduce uh, some modification uh, by applying sensor for the next research. Okay, so or this uh, figure just uh, I just uh, want to um, give the overview of my research that I treat um, the polluted water sample using different kind of soil. So the so uh, our our method is about a greener method and then combined with water metry also one of the green method. So uh, the next is the application of water metry in agricultural field, uh, for especially in soil analysis. Okay, this one uh, from the other researcher, but uh, I want to share in this um, about um, about the important. Uh, information or successful um, successful development of um, successful research regarding development of sensor. Okay, this kind of sensor has been developed by one of the scientists or chemists from University of Prince Song Khai, Thailand. Uh, he said that he successfully um, developed a sensor for in situ quantification of nitrate. Okay, for this kind of sensor, before uh, uh, it can be, uh, it has been put, uh, purchased by farmer because for, before they start to plant their crop, they check, need to check the quantity, uh, the amount of nitrate present in the uh, soil. If uh, there is um, enough amount of nitrate, then they can, um, they can start to plant their uh, crop and then uh, as we all know um, Thailand produce a high higher amount of um, good quality of um, food right food or crop or plantation okay and then uh, last on is the application of uh, water metry in forensic uh, as in drug analysis so for um, for this kind of drug analysis basically we are using uh, we are using a conventional method such as gc hplc 
and others, also UV. Uh, but for this uh, kind of uh, future project, uh, I am encouraged uh, every one of us to uh, establish or develop a method to help the uh, police uh, department to develop a sensor that can uh, be used for in-situ analysis for uh, kratom or ketom, ketom cases. Okay, uh, for ketom cases, uh, this is the abusing of this ketom has been increasingly um, great among the youngster. And then it's uh, currently uh, classified as new psychoactive uh, substance NPS that is um, harmful to uh, people or youngsters that uh, consume higher dose of ketone. And then we uh, basically we detect ketone based on the compound that uh, contribute to the higher dose or, or to contribute to um, the drug uh, element mitragyna speciosa. So if any one of us can develop a sensor, then we can uh, apply it in Malaysia or in another country to solve the cases regarding of ketum and also another uh, cases, um, another type of drug, metaketamine or others. Okay. Okay. So summary for my... Um, sharing today so for so this uh, voltammetry method is kind of uh, alternative uh, analytical method instead of we using the conventional method of pc and hplc and also for this method we can apply different type of electrode which is very analysis for a different kind of analyte and then um, most importantly we need to remember that this the uniqueness of voltammetry it can simultaneously detect the multi element uh, that present in your um, sample and also it's capable to detect up to ppt level and then it uh, can be considered as one of the sensitive metal. And then uh, last but not least, for this kind of voltammetry method, we need to transfer our technology and giving by, uh, back to community by develop a sensor for in-situ analysis. So that's all for my sharing. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Narasmat, for your sharing on the application of the voltammetry. So, uh, as we can see, there's a lot of uh, applications um, using voltammetry in environmental, in drugs detection, and so on. So, in this application, actually, um, one of the part that involved is in developing the sensors, right? Because different type of analyte needs different type of sensors specifically. So to know how to develop the sensor, right? I would like to invite Dr. Tana Lechemi Paramalingam, postdoctoral researcher of uh, Faculty of Science UPM, to share a little bit of, uh, on her knowledge on the sensor development in voltammetry. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Tana. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, please. The floor is yours. Okay, good day everyone. I'm here to share some information on voltammetric sensor development. Okay, I'm Dr. Tana, postdoc UTM. Okay. Okay. What is uh, voltammetric sensor development? Okay, it's about the working electrode modification. Okay, as we can see here, there are many types of working electrodes such as Upper electrode, micro electrode, gold or platinum electrodes. Okay, 
these type of electrodes can be modified and introduced as a doublet sensor. Okay, why we need to do sensor development in voltammetric field? Okay, there are several methods have been applied in analytical chemistry. That is a conventional method like uh, chromatography, like HPLC, GC, and the spectrophotometry, capillary electrophoresis. But these methods are having some disadvantages, such as complicated sample preparation, too much of time consuming, and also high production of solvent with. So we choose voltammetry as the alternative method. Okay. But in voltammetry, in voltammetry, there is a very few problems like a toxicity issue due to the mercury electrodes and a poor sensitivity of bare carbon electrodes. So we need to do electrode modification. Okay, the purposes of electrode modification. The main purpose of electrode modification is to reduce the limit of detection, the LOD value. The lowest the LOD values, the sensitivity of the sensitivity of the electrode is very good. Okay, the second one is to increase the electrochemical response. Okay, we can see here this figure. Okay, this is from my uh, research. Okay, I analyzed the pesticide paraquat dichloride using bare and modified. Um, okay, yeah, I want to open my. Okay. 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 Sorry. Okay. Choose the results for the paraqua analysis using bare and modified screen printed electrode. This is the screen printed electrode with the connector. Okay, I did analysis for paraqua dichloride. Okay, from here we can see the modified screen printed electrode gave a very good stripping signal. Uh, it's about two times higher stripping signal compared to bare screen printer electrode. It shows that the modified screen printer electrode give a higher sensitivity compared to the bare screen printer electrode. Besides that, the electrode modification can increase the stability of the electrode. Okay, and it can improve the selectivity towards the target analog pesticide or analyte okay okay here i've shared uh, some of my results okay where i did the experiment on interfering ion effects metal ion effects i choose five types of metal ion that's a cadmium copper iron light and zinc okay what i did i mixed these with the uh, solution that contain the paracord dichloride and i did the analysis using the uh, modified screen printed electrode okay as we can see here, there is a no change. There is a no significant change on the uh, initial peak of paracord dichloride in the presence of this, those metal ion. It shows that the modified screen printed electrode, okay, the modified electrode has a very good selectivity. Okay, and the most important thing is we must consider about this, uh, the modified electrode whether it is safe to be used or not okay and then it can be alternative for mercury electrode okay and in i would like to share some of my research output i use hb pencil lead just the lead just the pencil lead here okay to mod uh, as an electrode where i able to introduce uh four uh, I'm able to use this bare and modified pencil lead electrode, HB pencil lead electrode, for analyze five types of pesticide. And uh, I'm very happy that I'm successfully published my works in ISI journals related to modification of HB pencil electrode. Okay, now I'm proceed with uh, the methods for surface modification on working electrode. There is a three types of uh, modification. The first one, direct or drop casting. Direct or drop casting where we will uh, dope the uh, 
known amount of the poly, uh, polymer solution and let it dry. Okay, this is the example of the uh, modified electrode after the dopant is uh, dried on the electrode. Okay, then the second one for my research for glassic cover electrode, screen printed electrode, I use this technique. And my for my pencil, I used deep coating process. Okay, it's there is a five step that we follow for this uh, process. The first one is dipping, emission, withdrawing, drainage and evaporation. Okay, for my, as I said before, for my pencil electrode, I use this technique. Okay, and that's another technique. It can be considered as still new and uh, have, haven't been so popular. Okay, that's a spin coating. Okay, they're using cell instrument. The instrument that um, related to the fiber production method, which uses electrical force or high voltage. Okay, when the fibrous uh, modifier form on the electrode, once uh, the formation, uh, the electrode already modified with the fiber, then they will use for the detection or for the experiment. Okay. Now uh, we look at the selection of materials for um, for uh, electrode modification. Okay. There are there are many types of materials can be used for modification, such as uh, carbon nanotube like the graphene, graphene oxide, multi-walled carbon nanotube is quite famous. The multi-walled carbon nanotube is quite famous a modifier that we use for the uh, modification, especially for glassy carbon electrodes. And then uh, we can use metal or metal oxide and the biological receptor. Can, uh, we can uh, modify the uh, sensor and uh, introduce as a biosensor where we can use the DNA protein or enzyme as the modifier and uh, the, uh, then uh, we can use the polymers like conductive polymer like uh, polyfuran, polyaniline, polypyro, P dot. This uh, polypyro is some one of the top polymers that we can use for uh, sensor modification. Okay, uh, uh, here is one example where the one of the researcher using uh, zinc oxide where it in a Modified with the, uh, they use the zinc oxide and manganese called nanocomposite to modify the classic carbon electrode for riboflavin. Uh, that's a vitamin C uh, determination. Okay, the property of the applied modifier can affect the. Uh, we must uh, we must uh, know that the property of the applied modifier can affect the performance of the sensor. So we must be. Uh, so uh, we must be consider about the properties of the modifier before you choose for the sensor modification. So this person, this researcher, able to find out that zinc oxide have a large binding energy and give excellent chemical and thermal stability. Okay, then I show you the second example. Okay, and uh, this is the diagram shows the how the uh, researchers okay did the surface modification on the classic carbon electrode by using carbon nanotubes, carbon carbon nanomaterial that is uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene nano uh, free bands, and the this researcher they mix the carbon nanomaterials with the biological receptor. Okay, as I mentioned here, and they targeted, uh, they able to determine the organic compounds like uh, two aminophenol and four aminophenol. This is the organic compounds, but from the uh, this researcher able to uh, find out or uh, able to uh, show, able to get the well too well defined of the organic compounds, aminophenols, and four aminophenols using this modified glassy carbon electrodes, okay? Now, I want to explain about the application of developed sensor or electrode, okay? And from this, uh, okay, for your information, glassy carbon electrode is widely used in uh, voltammetry analysis. 
Well, uh, it can uh, because it have a large diameter of working area. This is the working area. We call it the working area, and it allows the measurement in a wide potential, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Faizwan and uh, Dr. Joy and Dr. Asmat. Okay, it's a very have uh, has a wide potential range from negative one to one point two to positive one point two, and it uh, has. Fast electrokinetic due to, due to its high electrode transfer rate, and uh, it can uh, be reused by polishing the surface. Okay, and then uh, I show you this example for uh, using classic carbon electrode for analysis the ascorbic acid. Okay, ascorbic acid is a vitamin C. Okay, using the multi walled carbon nanotubes. Okay, we can see here from this diagram. Okay. The stripping signal for uh, the current reading for bad uh, classic carbon electron and the classic carbon electron that uh, modified with class modified with um, multi wall carbon nanotubes. Okay, it's almost three times or uh, almost two to three uh, almost three times higher the stripping signal uh, it's the voltammetric response that's a stripping signal the voltammetric response is a higher because it has the large surface area and potentially high electroactive and shows better sensitivity okay this uh, this diagram clearly show the voltammetric response for bare and modify electrode. This is why we want to do the surface modification and introduce newly developed sensor. Okay, now I want to explain about the carbon paste electrode. Okay, this is the carbon paste electrode. Okay, we have diagram tube and we have a rod, copper rod. Okay, uh, the modifying uh, paste normally we will. Uh, once we prepare the modifier paste, we will put inside the diagram tube and compress using this copper rod, and then we will connect it to the voltammetric setup. Okay, CPE, okay, carbon paste electrode is a very cheap, easy preparation, and their active surface area can be fast renewed, and it exhibits reproducible surface area. Plus, this CPE give a uniform distribution of the catalyst or modifier into the and it show better stability in aqueous solution okay now okay here is uh, i got summarized the um the determination of riboflavin the riboflavin as a vitamin b2 and this is the structure for riboflavin okay here, I have summarized the definition of riboflavin using carbon paste electrode with different type of modifier. Okay, there is a one of the researchers, they're using manganese dioxide. And this modifier give a high catalytic effect during the analysis, which is very good for uh, photometric determination. And some of the uh, researchers they're using ionic liquid as the modifier and then this ionic liquid can give a high conductivity and increase the sensitivity and transfer and there is also some uh, researchers they focus on uh, application of surfactant like a sodium laurel uh, sulfate uh, as the uh, modifier and then and this surfactant can uh, extremely sensitive to the acidic and basic media plus it can reduce the over potential for the reduction and oxidation of the analyte okay and each uh, for your information each modifier has its own capability to enhance the voltammetric response okay Okay, now I'm going to talk about the sensor that's uh, the innovative uh, strip that's called screen printed carbon electrode. It's just a very small electrode and then 
it's a uh, very small and very uh, like about the uh, less than 5 cm the length okay it is a very uh, it's a disposable device designed to work with the micro volume of sample and low cost and it's called as innovative strip okay we have the in one strip we have all the uh, counter electrode working electrode and reference electrode and okay as i show in uh, my previous slide okay and then uh, this example uh, okay about the nickel nanoparticle and naphium graphene oxide have been used as the modifier on the screen printer electrode for chemical oxygen demand detection. Okay, we can see here the modified electrode give a better uh, signal compared to bare electrode. On uh, this researcher able to, uh, uh, able to give the knowledge that uh, the oxide GO enables a high catalyst loading, increase the electro contact and leading to external electro catalytic. Okay, actually for the sensor development, the most important thing is the type of the modifier that we want to use and then the analyte. And then we must uh, make sure that uh, we choose the right modifier to get a very good performance of the electrode okay as the summary the development of sensor is a one of the most wanted area in chemistry research of okay. suitable modifier will be produced an effective sensor as i mentioned before the developed sensor or electrode proved to be stable reproducible selective sensitive and also can be simple uh, electrodes okay and the newly developed sensor also need to be safe eco-friendly and, uh, and green sensor as compared to mercury electrode that's all for me thank you for listening all right thank you so much uh, dr tana for your sharing on the uh, sensors development using voltammetry technique right that's uh, you know a lot of uh, information there on how to develop sensors all right um now i would like to open for the q and a session for the audience you can just drop on the questions there at the uh, facebook comments and then i will read to the uh, to all the panelists do you have any comments there any any, any questions Right. Okay, because uh, in the Facebook Live is quite delay. All right, so we just wait for a while. There's some delay there. Can I ask Dr. Joey? Oh, you want to ask Dr. Joey? Yes, sure. Dr. Joey, I will try. Uh, Dr. Joey, I want to ask you. Dr. Joey, I will try to uh, develop a pencil electro. I think you did the experiment on that, right? Yes, yes. Okay, doctor, you try to detect what type of analyte? Uh, we actually we have different platforms for uh, electrochemical application of pencil electrodes. So we have potentiometric platform, voltammetric platform. So we mainly use the pencil electrode for uh, potentiometric platform. Mm -hmm. So we actually modify the pencil with polyanilin or polypyrrole. And mm -hmm. we dope them with like nitrate iron, and mm -hmm. if the polymer is doped with nitrate iron. Then mm -hmm. you can use it as a potentiometric iron selective electrode for nitrate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of voltammetry, our, actually our students are not very active in voltammetric uh, application of pencil. It's because our voltammetric system is very limited here. But we have a lot of millivolt meter. And so uh, students can easily use the millivolt meter, the potentiometric setup uh, for uh, research using pencil electrode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Joey. 
because I'm really I'm really surprised why the study on the pencil electrode quite uh, quite uh, not too much. You know, it's a very uh, I see few pub, uh, papers only published on the uh, modification of uh, pencil electrode. Yeah. But uh, during my study, when uh, when I did my PhD project, I found out this a very simple, low cost and very easy electrode for the precision analysis. I don't know why people or other researchers don't want to cho choose it and then try yeah. to you know, commercialize it in the good way, something like that. Actually, one, one limitation that I can see with pencil is because uh, pencil is developed for writing. Mm -hmm. And so when the companies that are preparing them are developing the, you know, this pencil, they use additives, binders that are, they don't have anything in mind about electrochemical application of pencil. And so the limitation is actually the binders to make it a very good writing tool. And they don't normally put, you know, when we buy a pencil, particularly commercial pencil, we, we don't see the chemical composition of the binder. We just say graphite. So mm -hmm, the yeah. on it is graphite. But I have used a lot of uh, pencil from China, for example, and the last batch I bought a lot, but it didn't work very well. It's probably because it has binders that are not really compatible with what electrochemistry needs to do. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, high purity graphite into a, into a pencil would be better. But of course, <laughs> when you are just buying pencil, we have no idea, you know, how much. Yeah. So I think the best solution is to buy the B, the Bs, like 2B, 3B, 4B, because they have more yeah. than the And then uh, I, I have read some journal. I don't know. I forgot already the author's name. They use HB. That's why I use HB. And HB uh, shows a very good conductivity. That's oh, that's good. I then I got tried with the other pencil. It, it was uh, got some, not, it was so, was not so good uh showing the uh, water metric response it's, yeah. too good in water it's metric. actually very tricky to to yeah. uh, to use them because we have no mm -hmm. idea uh, about the chemical composition of the binder they mix it right they mix the ingredients in the pencil yeah, uh, with graphite so it's graphite with something else yeah. and then to make sure that it's re really a very good pencil really ri good writing material so they have no intention of using it as electrode we are the only ones using it as electrode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I able to publish in the uh, good uh, uh, journals. That's why I'm surprising why uh, other researchers don't want to use it. Okay, even though we do like a polymeric po uh, polymeric uh, modification or chemically modified electrode, this type yeah. of uh, uh, developed uh, sensor, but there were this simple and low cost. Um, Electro can give a better stripping signal. Yeah, that's right. I think it's a, yeah, it's a very good challenge for because uh, the polypyrrole is very expensive. I think because I early my plan is want to do the modification using the polypyrrole. It's so just a few milliliters. It's very expensive, more than five k. And it deteriorates very quickly as well. So you have mm. to still to redistill every now and then. Yeah. So do we have questions from students? Right. Um, we don't have yet, but I would like to ask a question to Dr. Narasmat about the uh, application of the voltammetry in the environmental sample. Right? You said that um, there's a government agencies that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, are seeking for collaboration and in detecting uh, the, uh, I thought uh, this is arsenic, right? Yes, arsenic. Arsenic in the... Um, Water supply or what? Water, no water supply. Uh, some uh, of the agency um, want to focus the uh, based on the what wastewater treatment that contain the arsenic, and one of the uh, um, focus on the treatment of arsenic in the water supply, in uh, especially in uh, Sungai Ru in Perak. And also in Kelantan, we have also uh, one river that uh, being uh, contaminated with arsenic. So we now uh, uh, collaborate to overcome this problem. 
part is to uh, detect or, or to 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 analyze the water sample or, or to develop a sensor for that. Yes, to to develop a validated method of water right. metry, and then uh, future uh, we want to develop a sensor. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, yesterday I watched uh, Channel News Asia, uh, you know, the news channel from Singapore. One of the one of the Singapore company uh, is a technology company, a scientific based mm -hmm. company. They have developed a rapid test for COVID nineteen using mm -hmm. sensor. Wow, very well, interesting. Yes. They, they, they apply the concept of uh, I think it's it's a concept of uh, voltammetry because uh, they just uh, put the uh, you know swab uh, sample on the on the cartridge of electrodes and then they slot in the electrodes to their instrument and for about um i think not more than one minute they mm -hmm. get the result i think uh, the, but it's not, yes i think it seemed like a development of the screen printed electrode yes. yes. and they screen using printed, that they, they apply the screen that printed electrode printed. concept like yes. can i explain um, yes. i try to search the video i think i found it um I try to uh, show here because you see that in the news actually. So yes, it's the rapid a uh, rapid kit, I think. Okay. Now this, they try to develop the screen printer electrode. Yes, it's a screen printer it's a electrode. Now I have this seen it in the news, but I will I will uh, search for that because I let I want uh, us to know about the applic the latest application on the uh, rapid test of the COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah. Look, look, what can you search it for? Okay, um, I I will show. I'm searching for that. So um, right now, um, I'm looking on the uh, Facebook comments. Do we have any question now? The test mate. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can ask anybody <laughs> for a while. Okay. okay, the test mate. I want to yeah. ask you. Uh, can you uh do you want to try any other modified electrodes for your study on arsenic uh three and five? Yes, I am open to offer collaboration for any of our researcher in our talk today. Then uh we can collaborate together. Then we propose to this uh, government agency or academic institution or the industrial um industrial uh, player. Mm -hmm. Mm, because uh, as I said before, as explained by in the paper. Hello? Okay. Do you have line problem, Dr. Tana? Hello? We can't hear you. Okay. Now, okay? All right. Yes, okay. now, okay. You, you want to ask Dr. Joey? No, no, I'm asking. I want to talk with the. Uh, I want to share my knowledge with the Dr. Asmai. Okay, Dr. Asmai, mm -hmm. later okay. when you want to publish your paper and it will be some, you know, some problems that they will question on that. Why you want to use uh, working up uh, uh, this one, uh, mercury electrode? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I have, uh, I got the comment from uh, one of the reviewers for my particle analysis using HMDE. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, luckily I able to publish that paper. Oh, <laughs> congrats. We have, we have several questions now. Oh. Okay, uh, the first one, I think um, it goes to Dr. Joey, all right, from Shafiq Hizam. I'd like to know during cyclic voltammetry, we can get the potential window of our electrolyte in a range of potential. In the application of hydrogen production, can we go beyond the potential window or is it going to cause degradation of electrolyte? Oh, very good question. <clears throat> yeah. uh, actually, 
as I mentioned in my presentation, the potential window is very important to establish before we perform any voltammetric experiment, because this window is the clear window wherein the uh, something in your electrode or in solution is not interfering with the analysis. Uh, his question is, can we go beyond the the range? Uh, we're in with beyond the anodic limit or the cathodic limit. He specifically asked about the reduction of hydrogen. Yes, I think the quest the answer to answer the question: Can we go beyond uh, the anodic and cathodic limit? The answer is actually yes, if we can control the background because we can always subtract the background, even if we are already reaching about uh, towards the anodic limit or cathodic limit. If we can record the background, so if the potential is increasing around near the anodic limit, we can record that background and subtract it with the actual experiment. But that is when the when the anodic uh, limit um, uh, component is actually not so much. But when it comes to hydrogen evolution, which is actually reduction of water. If our solvent is water, then we have unlimited, you know, supply of hydrogen. So the answer in terms of going beyond hydrogen is probably no, because uh, definitely as we move beyond the hydrogen, there will be more hydrogen that will be produced. But in other limit, probably in the anodic limit, wherein we can uh, control and we can record and then we can subtract later on, uh, it, we can go beyond. But um, we cannot always do that. So it depends on the extent of the uh, uh, limitation of these limits. Yeah, okay. I, I answered the question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, next question um, from Zamharira Ahmad Mashad. Okay, this is my student actually. So, um, Assalamualaikum and a good afternoon. Can I know for the uh, wastewater analysis, what is the best uh, sensors uh, for the development of the method uh, that can be introduced? Dr. Asmat? Any comment on that? Uh, I think I'm not the right person for the development of sensor. I think right. uh, we can have Dr. Joy or Dr. Tana. But I think uh, that's similar with one that uh, we use as a strip. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes. Can Dr. Tana or Dr. Joy? Okay, I think, uh, for this question, uh, the first thing for sensor development, I think the, the best uh, the best practice uh, to be, um, you know, to be... Uh, to be sure that for the sensor development is the first one we need to be um so the, the sensor itself need to be selective for the analyte right yes and, then, and of course if we if we develop a sensor it should be rapid because right you know the, the, the process to to detect the analyte should be fast right and then mm -hmm. of course the other um uh, factors such as uh, uh reproducibility, repeatability, and so on. I think Dr. Tana can comment more about that. Uh, open your... Uh, uh, unmute first, Dr. Tana. You are mute. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry, okay. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Faizan. That one one for the uh, wastewater analysis, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Three wastewater analysis they can use it depends on the analyte. They some some they can use biologic biosensor. Mm -hmm. They can use biosensor. For example, they want to study on metals or something like that. They can use uh, glassy carbon uh, electrodes. All right. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> next question. I think is for Dr. Joey. Hi, doctor. Uh, I'm new in using, uh, this is from Ruwaida Ashikin. Hi, doctor. I'm new in uh, using cyclic voltammetry as part of my method in my study. Can you explain a bit on how does we can relate our result? For example, oxidation and reduction peak with uh, further current, I think. Oh. FC uh, divided by FC plus. I noticed that uh, most voltammer cramps that I found from papers will put uh, potential versus uh, Faraday current. Can you elaborate more on this? Principally, and does it mean uh, just comparing with known value of Faraday current? Or can we manually compare by conducting voltammetry on uh, the Faraday current compound 
at the same time. Uh, actually, you're, when you read the question, it didn't make sense to me. But if yeah. I interpret the FC, it's actually probably it's not paradigm current. Probably it's ferrocene. Yeah. Uh, What's that? It's, I think it's ferrocene because he's talking about the... Uh, okay, okay, okay. 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 The, All right. Sorry. The potential. Anyway, um, you see, the reason why we are in, in electrochemistry, particularly when we are comparing the anode and the cathode uh, potential... Okay. It's all relative. We cannot really measure the potential of a single electrode because we need to combine the anode with the cathode and the, the potential difference is the one that we measure. That's why we normally use a reference electrode. And the reference electrode is the one that provides a constant potential when we plot the electrode. That's why it's very important for a voltammogram to, to, to uh, include the reference electrode used, whether it's a silver, silver chloride or a columnar electrode or standard hydrogen electrode. Now, sometimes in voltammetry, particularly in uh, non-aqueous organic uh, solvent, we cannot use really the standard columnar and silver-silver chloride electrode. So sometimes we just use a platinum wire as the reference electrode. We call it a pseudo-reference electrode. And when, we, when you are not using a non-standard reference electrode, the potential somehow changes. So what we do is we normally add like ferrocene or ferrocenium, some uh, standard uh, redox substances that we know the exact location or the exact oxidation or reduction potential. So actually ferrocene is a very popular internal standard in voltammetry. So if we are using ferrocene as an internal standard, we compare the direct, the, you know, the uh, potential of ferrocene with your compound of interest. And uh, that is the relative location in terms of uh, potential, all right? And so that's the main reason why we are using ferrocene and ferrocenium couple uh, as a standard. It's because of the limitation of the voltammetric experiment. Maybe we cannot use a normal reference electrode. That's why we are using an internal uh, reference electrode, a kind of an internal, not reference electrode, uh, but an internal standard to provide us with the actual location of the uh, redox, the peak, the, the oxidation or reduction peak in the uh, potential, in the potential. Uh, I hope that makes yeah. sense. But yeah, uh, that is kind of a way of, uh, you know, similar to the role of the reference electrode in voltammetry. All right, I, I think it's about, uh, you know, in analytical technique, of course, uh, if you are using analytical instruments, we need to do the, you know, um, the calibrations and it can be any method, right? Internal standards or external standards. Yeah. So, um, so I hope that Dr. Joey uh, answered your question, Roida, because normally uh, we don't explain just now on how um, uh, practically we use, because uh, in every experiment, we use the similar concept in other analytical instrument. We, we need to do calibrations, internal or external standard and so on. This is common for any energy consumers, all right? So I have uh, another question here. Okay, from, uh, this is uh, my colleague in UTM, Dr. Faiz Shakeh. Um, are, they, uh, are there any uh, limitation in terms of electrode modification on, uh, this is for the Tana, I think. Are there any uh, limitation in terms of electrode modification on ready-made uh, SPCE a product as compared to glass, uh, a glassy carbon electrode, for example, like um, electropolymerization technique for molecular imprinted polymer or other modification techniques. Or can you see by yourself, Tatana, the questions? Uh, he's asking about the limitation in terms of the electrode uh, modification for SPCE. SPCE. Yeah, so Yes, it's compared to glassy carbon electrode because, you know, uh, maybe uh, from the presentation, uh, he saw a lot of uh, application on the uh, glassy carbon electrode, but um, his question is about, are there any limitation on uh, modify, modifying the SPCE? SPCE, there's a, I don't think there's a limitation for that. This is just expensive, that's it. <laughs> Little okay. expensive, okay. And then uh, we must uh, very careful do uh, during doing the doping because the because okay. I can show I can share again my presentation.
Okay, Dr. Tana, you're sharing your slide again? Yeah. Okay. So I hope that it can help Dr. Faiz. Can you start sharing? Yeah, we can. Okay, sorry. For Waida, question is ferrocene, right? Sorry. Because I use another laptop there to see the questions. Hello. All right. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Yeah, sharing slide. Okay. Yeah, I'm sharing, but uh, there is some problem here. But it's okay. The actually the stripping, uh, the screen printed electrode is a very uh small size. We should uh do the uh, modification carefully. That's it because it's uh, related with the uh counter electrode. Is everything is there. If you uh if you want to do modification, we must identify first where is the surface of the uh working electrode everything, because I have experience where I uh coated the uh uh the not the uh working electrode the other part of the electrode, like uh, it's like like uh. Uh, what we call it, it's like uh, absorbed it at the, another place. So it, we must make sure the volume of the modifier for SPE. The limitation is the volume of the modifier. Because it's a right. very little, very little, um, uh, very little place for this modification for doing the doping or direct casting on the electrode. All right. I hope you can. So okay. the, working, the working area is very uh, small yeah. for the screen printer electron. You, you want to add something, Dr. Joy? Yeah, actually, I, I just want to uh, reiterate what Dr. Tan is trying to say. Yeah. Uh, you see, in a, in a screen printed electrode, the three electrodes are already there in a single electrode, the reference, yeah. counter, and the working electrode. So if you are trying to modify this working electrode, which is very close to the reference electrode and counter electrode in a screen printed electrode, you cannot just immerse them in your modifying solution. Yeah. You have to be very careful in just applying your modifier on that small space which is just the working electrode and like if you are modifying a glassy carbon electrode which is an electrode on its own you can actually you have the luxury of immersing that in the whole bunch of solution and uh, you are very convenient it's very convenient in modifying a carbon electrode but i think that is one of the greatest limitation of the uh screen printed electrode is yeah. the availability of the space for modification so it's not so easy to modify okay thank you for the answers Right, I think now uh, there are no more questions. All right, I think uh, I would like to share the quiz now for everyone. You need to answer the quiz. Okay, we have for how many viewer now? About eighty two viewers. Maybe um, there's a a lucky viewers among all of you. All right, but before that, I, I think I need to share the video. I think I have the video now. Okay, um, wait for a while. I need to share the, the, the latest development of a uh, sensor for COVID 19. All right. Okay. I think the, the news is quite latest so that they, they don't publish it yet, but it's okay. So now I would like to share uh, the queasy session right now. Okay. 
can you see the question uh, sorry yeah but the uh... I have start the live uh, quiz right now. I'll wait for a while. Okay, uh, wait for a while. I think the, some problem with the uh, browser. Try to open the question um, for a while. Asma, dot Asma. Hi, okay, dot Asma. Okay, uh, maybe we can discuss something while waiting for the questions. Yes, yeah, you may discuss on something because it's quite <laughs> long time to open it. May I know the concentration of the arsenic in the one of the river at Lantan, as you mentioned before? Oh, um, not Maybe in Kelantan, uh, in Sungai Rui. Uh, we have oh. the information regarding Sungai Rui. Uh, what we have detected using EAS about uh, 40 ppm. Oh my god, ppm. Uh, so 40 people PPS? at some side of uh, Sungai Rui, be careful. Where is the place in Sungai Rui? Be? Um, in Pera, uh... oh, very dangerous. Is it there is there any agriculture near to the data? Um, uh, there are, uh, there is one uh, news that reported uh, the villagers uh, suffer of skin disease oh. uh, and also the That's crop death. Uh, some problem to plant uh, the crop there. So, so 40 ppm is a very, oh my gosh, scary. <laughs> because it can cause cancer, right? Yes. So that's why we as a chemist uh, try to uh, develop a method to detect and uh, remove. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, uh, apply to the Sungai Rui for the treatment. And then, uh, so we can overcome the problem. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to use any absorbent for this uh, for your studies, or uh, just focus on the water metric? Okay. All right. I think we are ready right now. Okay. We may start now the quiz. All right, for all the viewers, you have to open joinmyquiz.com and enter the code 61010X, the 106, all right? And then um, you will, okay, we have uh, not yet have any participants, okay? Please open joinmyquiz.com 
and enter the join code 610106. We have a uh, Lukman now. Right. We have Shafiq. FS. <laughs> All right. We have three, five, okay, seven, Farah, Shafiq Hizam. Irfan, okay, we have 10 players right now, we wait for a while, we have Aim, Nida, Farah, Tina, Rao, Gerald, Shafika, okay, keep increasing, we still waiting. We have twenty three players, twenty four right now. Just open joinmyquiz.com and uh, enter the join code 610106. Okay. Uh, we wait for about uh, two more minutes for the player. Right. There will be special prizes for top three winners. Okay, uh, can we wait until 40 players, all the panelists? Now we have 37, 38, 39, Forty, okay. Oh. Still increasing. Okay, one more minute, please. One more minute. Okay, it's all. Okay, you have 30 seconds more. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, 
1. Okay, we start the quiz now. Oh, we have an, one last participant. Don't know. His name is Don't Know. Okay, so we will start now the quiz. <laughs> Okay, the players who have entered the game will saw the we will see the questions. If you enter, you will see the questions. So now they are fighting. <laughs> we can see the top scorer now is Zakia. Number two is uh, oh now Ramzi is number one. So the panelists now we can see only the scoreboard. If you don't enter the the game, you don't join the game, the quiz. So you only call, uh, you only can see the scoreboard. Okay, uh, I can show all the panelists the question as well. So Shafiq is now number one. Kind of nervous. Oh, comment from Muhammad Ramziuddin. Ramziuddin. Okay. Don't be nervous. Just play the quiz. Just answer the quiz. <laughs> Okay, still fighting, come on. Okay, this is the new ranking. Ifan is number one. Raida Riki number two and Faraliana number three. So the top three. Oh, now number three. Okay, the third place is changing right now. So, Number one is Ifan. Oh, Ifan. Ifan is no longer number one. We are still waiting.
the first place is now goes to Ira, second place goes to Irfan, and the third place goes to Nana. about nine more persons uh you don't complete the question yet right come on complete the questions because it the the ranking could be changed if you answer the question right Seven more players need to complete the question. As we can see the ranking now, the first place goes to Ira, second place goes to Irfan, and third place goes to Nana. Ira scores a point 10,465, Irfan 9,540, and Nana 8,815. And the fourth place goes to Nida, 8,800 points. And Faraliana, 8,785 points. All right, now I think all the players have complete answering the question. We have how many players? We have two. Oh, some of them are still answering the questions. I think the time is already enough for answering the question. Okay, we can see now we have uh, about 51 players. All right. All the panelists, can we end the quiz now? Sure. All right. So, five, four, three, two, one. All right. That's all. So, the first place goes to Ira. Second place goes to Ifan. And um, the third place goes to Nana. Okay. All right. 
And the fourth place goes to Nida and number five, Paraliana. I think um, I have uh, increased the prizes, okay? So we, we will give to five top winners. Is it okay for all panelists? All right. So we discuss about locations, okay? Number one, which of the following item is not the electrode in the voltammetry? Conducting, conducting <laughs> electrode. <laughs> conducting electrode, right? This is not okay. The uh, answer. Okay. Um, in voltammetry, what are the common parameter involved? Potential current. Mm. Potential and current. So the migration of particles in the solution are in these three ways, except immigration, <laughs> <laughs> migration, convection, and diffusion. And immigration, immigration is the I like that. No, <laughs> it's not the way for oh, immigration because of COVID. <laughs> because of COVID nineteen. <laughs> okay, which of the following electrodes are often used as a counter or auxiliary electrode in voltammetry? Thermal electrode, carbon paste, platinum wire, and mercury tin film. So the answer is platinum wire. Okay. And then uh, which of the following voltammetric technique enhance the sensitivity to improving the Faraday current? Stripping voltammetry. All right. Which of the following voltammetric techniques enhance the sensitivity through elimination of the background current? Pulse voltammetry. Okay. So the vital reason for choosing voltammetry instead of other method is simultaneous detection of different species. All right. That is a specialty of the voltammetry. Um, why the gold electrode is used when detecting the arsenic species in wastewater treatment due to the positive potential of arsenic. All right. Voltammetry is limited to analysis of inorganic samples only. True or false? Pause. All right. Because we can we can also detect the organic analyze. Okay. The main purpose of electrode modification is to decrease the detection limit. True or false? True. All right. We need to lower the detection limit. Okay. Deep coating process is one of the methods for electrode surface modification. True. Right. And the last one is. A graphene oxide is not a carbon nanomaterial. Four, all right. This is it is the carbon nanomaterial. So, so I hope that um, you are satisfied with the result. Okay. Um, where can I see the result of the of the players okay, here? Okay. Can I give full report? Okay, there. Okay. The accuracy, 50% answer correctly. <laughs> I think it's achieved uh, <laughs> the, you know, the objective today, half of the participants can answer the, the uh, or, or, sorry, half of the question answer correctly. Okay. All right. Um, okay, for those who uh, who classic as classified as the uh, top five winners, okay, I will give the a link for all of you to fill for your um, information for us to you know, you know to give you the prize. Okay, and uh, the information is only about your names, your university, and your address and so on. I will give the form in the comments. In the Facebook live comments, all right, and then, um, Dr. Joey, yes, I think, uh, there's one last question. I think this is from far away from here, I think from Saudi or where <laughs> from Abdul Fakir. Uh, can, can we, can we add one more question to you? Actually, I read the question, you read uh, the question, it's in corrosion, right? The reference electrode in corrosion, all right. Actually, I have no idea on how to answer this question because uh, corrosion system is very different from voltammetry uh, because of the corrosive, as you as you can see, yeah. uh, corrosive yeah. nature. 
of the experiment. So yeah. I have actually, I'm not an expert uh, in terms of the reference electrode for corrosion experiments. So I don't think I can contribute something meaningful in this question. So I would rather not pretend to know everything this time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank so you. Apologies, apologies for missing that question. Thank you. All right, okay. Thank you. Okay, I think um, that's all for today for our online global classroom. For voltammetry, a practical beginner guide. The topic uh, chosen for this uh, online global classroom is, you know, um, is very catchy because um, for the beginner, we share the practical guide. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, and then I start with the theory and come out with, uh, and then after that, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Joy have explained about the uh, techniques and methods in voltammetry, and then uh, followed by Dr. Uh, Nasma has explained on the applications of the voltammetry, and then Dr. Tana uh, share uh, with us about the development of the sensors in voltammetry. I think that is quite enough as a practical beginner guide for us in voltammetry. And to know details about voltammetry, of course, we have to learn uh, more than these three hours. Okay. And if you have uh, another questions or you have uh, another, you know. And then thing to discuss with us, you can have our uh, email, okay? I will, uh, and then some of us are asking about the slides. Okay, I would like to ask all the panelists, um, they, they are asking about the slides. Can we share to them in, in, in the PDF form? All right, Dr. Joy say good. Dr. Tana say good, Dr. Asmat. Okay, okay, I will all right. to you. All right, so I will... Um, I will uh, compile all the slides in the form of PDF and I will give to those who are, you know, interested with the slide, okay? And then um, for now, I would like to thank all the panelists, okay? Especially to our district guest, uh, Professor Dr. Jose Hernandez Santos or Dr. Joy, okay? And then um, Dr. Narasman Omar Shukri, okay? Dr. Joy is from UC Brunei Darussalam, okay? Dr. Rasma is from USM, which is South Asia, um, Kuban Korean campus, Kelantan. Okay. Thank you uh, for inviting and stay uh, safe. And... Yes. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs> thank, yeah, you, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Tanalachmi Paramalingam, a postdoctoral researcher of Faculty of Science UTM. She actually at her hometown right now. <laughs> Right, and um, thank you, that, Dr. Isai, for yes, giving us uh, this opportunity. Thank you to Dr. Uh, Joy again. And I hope that we can collaborate more after asking. this. I hope that we can collaborate more after this. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah sure. Thank you. All right, and Thanks thank you Dr. also Dr. to all the uh, participants who who joined from the the, the beginning until now and. I hope that uh, we have, uh, you know, we have shared uh, uh, a good information for all of you, and we we have already answered a, a good question that you have already asked. We have uh, answered a good, um, you know, for your question that have been asked in the Facebook Live and in the WhatsApp and so on. All right, and with that, and see you again. Okay, I hope that we can benefit all this uh, session in our daily life, in our daily. A routine as a researcher, as an academician, and as a student. Okay, uh, thank you. Assalamualaikum and uh, very good um, afternoon. Afternoon. <laughs> we have a similar um, time zone with Brunei, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, bye, All right. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank okay. You. Um, for, for the panelists, I I will end the session and can you join my Webex link after this? We have something to discuss. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All sure. right. Okay, I will end the session for a while. I'm the host right now. No more uh, faculty of science host. Okay. So we don't have to go Bye. anywhere because you're here, right? Uh, all the panelists see in my Webex uh, link, okay? Uh, so we get off here. I get we off get here, off. yes. I will end the meeting. Thank you.